The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File Number 28. The clerk will report the bill. House File Number 28, Number 2 on the calendar for the day, an act relating to elections, the first engrossment. I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Hennepin, Representative Frazier, to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I rise to offer House File 28 to this body for consideration. House File 28 will restore the vote for individuals that are no longer incarcerated but may be on parole, probation, or supervised release. These disenfranchised individuals live in a the community. They are our neighbors, our friends, our daughters, our sons, our cousins, our mothers, our fathers. They have jobs. They help take care of their families. They pay taxes. They are subject to the laws and policy decisions that we make in this body. But in our representative government, they are deprived of the foundational right to vote, the right that gives them a voice and allows them to participate in our democracy. These are individuals that have been held accountable for their past decisions, yet they are forced to spend years, in some instances decades, shut out of the democratic process. In a nation built on a rule of law, accountability has its place. But the goal must always be geared toward furthering public safety, rehabilitation, and restoration. Our current law fails to further those three tenets. It does the opposite. Barring people from voting alienates them and increases the likelihood of reoffending. The current law has impact across the entire state. You will see from maps shared with each member that this is an issue that touches all of our districts. In addition, the history of felony voter disenfranchisement is an ugly one with explicitly racist overtones with direct ties to voter suppression of newly freed black people after the Civil War. At that time, the country saw state legislative bodies move quickly to expand and enact laws with the sole purpose of preventing the recently freed men from having the opportunity to participate in the democratic process. The legislators enacting these laws were clear about their intent and purpose. For example, the president of Alabama's Constitutional Convention made the purpose of the new felony provisions proclaiming a need to avert the menace of Negro domination. Another official noted that the crime of wife beating alone would disqualify 60% of Negroes. In 1890, Mississippi followed suit during this Constitutional Convention. The convention expanded the disenfranchisement provision from bribery, perjury, or other infamous crimes to bribery, burglary, theft, arson, obtaining money or goods under false pretenses, perjury, forgery, embezzlement, or bigamy, and those who had not yet paid their taxes. The delegates at the convention made it clear that crimes added to the list were offenses to which its weaker member of society, Negroes, were prone. But Minnesota's provision was unique. The state's disenfranchisement provision did not need to change as it had, other states around, as it had in other states around the country. Rather, the language was already sufficiently broad so as to allow for a gradual expansion. The word felony could encompass whatever crimes the legislator wanted. While its language may have remained the same, the pervasiveness of disenfranchisement, its widespread application and its impact on minority communities made Minnesota's provision effectively identical to those in the South. Over 100 years later, we can still see the disparate impact of these racist laws. In a recent brief by the Sentencing Project, it shows that Minnesota's voting laws disproportionately disenfranchise people of color who are overrepresented in the state's criminal justice system. For example, black Minnesotans make up about 7% of Minnesota's population, but comprise 36% of the state's prison population. Black and white disparities in prison population are twice the national average, with black Minnesotans in prison at nearly 10 times the rate of white Minnesotans. Racial disparities among people in Minnesota's large communities supervision programs are also significant. Black Minnesotans make up 19% of citizens on probation and 26% of citizens on supervised release. Native Americans make up 6% of people on probation and 10% of people on supervised release. While no official felony disenfranchisement estimates are available for Native Americans, their representation in Minnesota's population and criminal legal system indicates that they too are heavily impacted by felony disenfranchisement, laws and policies. 
High felony disenfranchisement rates among communities of color dilutes representation in our state's political system. And as a system set up on representation, if we can't all participate, we can't truly be representative of everyone in our state. Members, tonight we have the opportunity to correct the past and send a message to the individuals that have been deemed safe to reenter our communities, but have not been allowed to fully participate in our democracy by voting to restore their voting rights. I hope that after this debate, all Minnesotans will know that restoring the right to vote for those no longer incarcerated is not a partisan issue, but it is our obligation to do the right thing and restore them fully once they return to our communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are amendments at the desk. The clerk will report the First Amendment. <clears throat> Novotny moves to amend House Law Number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A8. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Sherburne, Representative Novotny, to explain his amendment. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, well, come on. My bill is a simple bill, and it simply uh, wants to change the bill that Mr. Frazier has to uphold the beliefs that we have in this society. We have a sacred contract with the society that we have certain behaviors and activities that we don't want people to do. Everyone drove, or except for a couple of people on light rail, drove to the Capitol today. And think of all the social contracts that we have that we will stay on our side of the road that we will obey the stoplights, that we will obey speed limits, that we will do our best not to hurt other people. And when that breaks down and society doesn't hold up those social contracts and make people stay within what we agree is the behavior that we should have, then society starts to break down, and I believe it has. We've seen that lately. One of the agreements that we have as part of the rehabilitation and restoration process is that you take care of your obligations. And my amendment would just ask that as part of the plea agreement or the conviction agreement and sentencing from the judge, that judge will assign either fines or restitution to the victim or anything that the judge has decided that they should pay back as part of their gaining their rights to become part of the society again. So my bill, my amendment to the bill would be to have the people pay off their fines, their fees, and penalties, including rest, criminal restitution, ordered by the courts before the restoration of the voting rights. I ask for your vote. Members, there is an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. <clears throat> Frazier moves to amend the Novotny Amendment to House Hall Number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment to the amendment is coded A-17. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Frazier, to explain the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, essentially what this amendment does is strike the language requiring full payment of fines, fees, and penalties. Uh, be before I, I close on this amendment, and I, I would like my members to accept this amendment to the amendment, I just want to say I'm a little disappointed. I thought after giving a brief history of how these uh, voter disenfranchisement laws came to be and what their purpose was, it would give some pause to offer amendments that essentially follow that tragic uh, history that we have in this country. Uh, this, this amendment, essentially, the amendment offered by Representative Novotny is essentially a poll tax. Poll taxes were found to be unconstitutional. Um, they are, when you look at the individuals that are given fines and fees uh, from our courts, it is usually put upon those that are the poorest 
that have the least amount of resources and often can't afford to pay those fees. So essentially creating a situation where they would not be able to pay those fees and they would not be able to regain their right to vote. I urge you to accept my amendment to the amendment and strike the language in the Novotny Amendment. Thank you. Any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Sherburne, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Speaker Wolgamott. I'd like to reply to the author, Representative Frazier. Um, I'd just like to point out to you that we are talking about the bill that is ha at hand, and this is about restoring of, of rights that we are dealing with now in the state of Minnesota. Uh, has there been horrendous civil rights violations in the past? Absolutely. But we're talking about people that have committed felonies in the state of Minnesota and have gone to court and have been given sentences by the courts recently. And uh, uh, I, I can't change the past, but I, I hope to make Minnesota a safer future by doing this. Ask for a roll call. Rep Representative Novotny requests a roll call vote, seeing 15 hands. There will be a roll call vote on the amendment to the amendment. Thank you. That'll be all. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Wright, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I too want to respond to Representative Frazier's claim that this is an attempt by one of our members to impose a poll tax. Fines, fees, penalties, including victim restitution, those pre-exist this bill, the underlying amendment, and the proposed amendment to the amendment. Are, are the fines, fees, penalties, and victim restitution currently due under our existing law a poll tax? If the answer is no, which I think is obvious, then this proposed um, underlying amendment is by no means a poll tax. I urge you to vote down the amendment to the amendment. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? Point of inquiry. Um, Representative Lee, for what purpose do you rise? Uh, will you please, uh, point of inquiry, will you remind us what, this is a question before the body. Uh, Representative Lee and members, we are debating the A-17 Frazier Amendment to the A-8 Novotny Amendment to House File 28. Any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Isanti, Representative Johnson. Mr. Speaker, members, I'm going to ask you to vote no on this amendment to the amendment. I'm actually one person that never did get the restitution that a suspect I was arresting from the injuries I sustained. That's why the law was finally changed so restitution was paid before fines were paid. We have a lot of people who have not received the restitution due to this day. From individuals who have committed felonies and have done serious injury to people. It's only fair that that restitution should be paid before they vote because these individuals live with those injuries and those memories the victims do for their entire life. Please vote no on this amendment. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? Before, oh, I recognize the member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I certainly fines and fees and penalties and restitution are all important and should be paid, but I should just point out that this is tying those fines and fees and penalties money to the right to vote, and that's what makes this a poll tax. If you were requiring that an individual pay money in order to have the right to vote, 
That is plain and simple a poll tax, and so every member in this chamber should vote with Representative Fraser. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Members, before I instruct the clerk to take the roll, I will remind us one more time that we are about to vote on the uh, A17 amendment to the uh, A8 amendment. The clerk will take the roll. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Members, we are now under discussion of the A8 amendment as amended. Is there any discussion? Mr. Speaker. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Sherburne, Representative Novotny. Well, um, little saddened by the, the, the twist and the characterization. I, I spent uh, a career standing up for victims and I will continue to stand up for victims of crime. And uh, yeah, the gross misrepresentation is, is upsetting. Um, but with that, I'll withdraw my, vote, my, my, my <laughs> amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Novotny has withdrawn the A8 amendment. There is another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Torkelson moves to amend House Hall number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A6. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson, to explain the amendment. Thank you, Speaker Walgamont. Uh, first, I think it's very important to remember that here in Minnesota, we are a heavy user of probation. Uh, and we rank in a very small number of states uh, that use probation very heavily, and we are a very light user of incarceration. That means uh, you're more likely to serve probation than incarceration. And in fact, there are some felonies uh, where serving any time in prison is very, very rare. And in fact, one of those felonies are fel is a set of felonies that involve elections. If you commit a felony regarding elections, you will not go, likely go to prison. Uh, there's a handout on the floor today that uh, we surveyed uh, results from 2017 to 2021. During that time, there were 65 election-related felonies. None of those felons went to prison. Under this law, a proposed law that we're working on today, uh, if you did commit an election-related felony, you would go right back again and vote in the next election. This hardly seems fair to the rest of the electorate, in my mind. Uh, there is a debt to society when you've committed a crime, uh, and there is, in this case, a debt to the election system. Uh, we are in a position in this country and in this state where many of our citizens have lost confidence in our election system. Passing this and allowing someone who commits a crime that is related directly to elections will decrease the confidence in our election system among the electorate and people are going to think there's just it's not a secure system and why should I vote when the system is not secure? Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, I urge a green vote on the amendment. There's an amendment to the A6 amendment at the desk. 
The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. <clears throat> Fraser moves to amend the Torkelson Amendment to House Law Number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment to the amendment is coded A14. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Fraser, to explain the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, essentially what this amendment to the amendment does is it replaces when the individual sentence has expired or is fully discharged with the individual is no longer incarcerated for the offense, and it also strikes language on voter attestation. I absolutely understand what Representative Torkelson was referring to in regards to um, election pieces. But the attestation piece is clearly aimed at folks having to report that they are a felon. And it's essentially more punishment and shame for that individual. There are no studies that have been done. There are no reports or services you can find that shows that using the criminal code by disallowing folks to vote furthers any public safety or restoration when individuals are back in the community, as our system has deemed they are safe to be back in the community with their families, having jobs, and paying taxes. So I urge members to accept my amendment to the amendment. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Representative Kwan, please use a different member's microphone so that we can hear your contribution to this discussion. I am sorry that my, I wasn't speaking loud enough. <laughs> I know of many cases where it wasn't a felon that voted illegally that was you know, charged and convicted of uh, a felony in the voting. Um, there, in fact, the legislative auditor looked at the registration system, and they did a second smaller sampling audit. And in that small sample, there were several people that uh, committed a felony and voted because they weren't allowed to vote even though they did not have a felony conviction. And there have been multiple occasions of where people have voted twice and they've been charged and convicted and the ones that I'm aware of, none of them were felons that had their voting rights suspended. So there are people here that their offense is against voting and the system. Their offense is right directed to the fact that they broke the law, they disenfranchised other people, by voting illegally. And I know, I've known many people through the years where I didn't have to use all the fingers on my one hand with the uh, difference in their, in their victory. I've known elections with one vote difference. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, if your offense is against the other voters, you should not have, you know, no repercussions, especially when it's a felony offense and it's tied to voting and you don't have your, any uh, effect on your voting rights. I think that it's just like if you do something driving and a DUI and other things where you lose the right to drive because it's related to your offense. This is related to the offense so I would say vote no on the amendment to the amendment. Sure, it's only going to be a few people that are affected by this, but I think it's appropriate. They learn if you break the law, commit a felony in the act of voting, that you're going to lose that right to vote while your sentence of uh, probation is concurrent. Any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? 
I recognize the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Speaker Wolgamon. I'd request a roll call. Representative Torkelson requests a roll call vote on the amendment to the amendment. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just remind the body that these crimes are crimes against our election system, that the people who have perpetrated these crimes in the last number of years, none of them, not one of them, has served any time in prison. And they, under this law, should it pass, will be able to vote in the next election uh, without any consequences to their voting rights, uh, even temporarily. It just seems to me, and I think it would seem to many others, that this is a situation where you've committed a crime against voters and against the system, that uh, it would be absolutely appropriate that you spend some time thinking about whether you should vote legally or not. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any further discussion? I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm wondering if the amendment's author, Representative Torkelson, would yield for question? He will yield, Representative Scott. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Torkelson, I know you're the GOP lead on the Elections Committee. Um, would this um, bill then, um, if this amendment would not go on, would this allow not only a person to who, um, create, who committed a fraud in a previous election not be held accountable and still be able to vote, but they could, again, commit another felon, not be in prison, and they could continually commit voter fraud and never lose their right to vote if this amendment doesn't go on. Is that the way you see it? I recognize the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Speaker Walmont, and thank you for the question, Representative Scott. That is exactly right. Uh, uh, felon who commits a felony related to elections will, under this bill, be able to continue to vote. Uh, and of course, they're taking the chance of getting caught again, but uh, there's nothing to prevent them from voting in the next election and every election moving forward. I recognize the member from Minoka, Representative Scott. Mr. Speaker and, and Representative Torkelson, thank you for that explanation. That's, that's kind of the, was my understanding too. And members, that's, that's not okay. That's just not okay, and I think previous versions of this bill um, had some carve-outs for that. So, members, this is that's not good. Somebody could just repeatedly be uh, 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 commit election fraud and just keep on going with no accountability, really, when it comes to voting. So, uh, members, this is this is very reasonable. I I would ask members support. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I've spent a lot of time working on elections in my years here. And, you know, we are always told that voter fraud doesn't happen, it's not a real thing. Well, I mean, thank you, Representative Torkelson, for the handout. Everybody, everybody should have this at their desk. 65 people, these are just the people who were convicted and sentenced of a felony. Felony voting violation. That's what we're talking about here. A felony voting violation. We wanna talk about democracy all of the time. This is democracy right here. Democracy is on the ballot right now in this chamber. Democracy is on the ballot right now in this chamber. And the underlying amendment from Representative Torkelson simply says that if you have committed a felony when it comes to voting, that you probably shouldn't have the right to vote until your, the, the duration of your punishment is fulfilled. And I don't remember who said it, but uh, you know, we, it's well known in Minnesota that we, oh, it was probably Representative Torkelson, we are a very high, low incarceration state. We toggle sort of between the second and third lowest rates of incarceration in the entire country. We choose to not incarcerate our citizens here. And instead, instead of that punishment, we choose a different form of punishment. 
We choose to put people on probation so that they continue, they can continue their lives in their communities. But we've still got some restrictions on that. And those restrictions are there for good reason. They are to protect people, they are to hold people accountable. And they're and, and they're in place to protect our systems, whether that be the public safety of individuals, or in this case, whether it be the sanctity of our vote. And in this case, we should choose to protect the sanctity of our vote. It is a red herring to say that somehow this is shaming people. Well, I'm sorry, you've already gotten a felony conviction. You should maybe be a little ashamed of the behavior that you engaged in to receive that felony conviction. This, this amendment, the underlying amendment, is about protecting democracy. And the amendment to the amendment bastardizes that and takes it away completely. Let's protect democracy today. Let's vote no on the amendment to the amendment. Is there any further discussion? Members, before I instruct the chief clerk to take the roll, I would like to remind us that we will be voting on the A14 amendment to the A6 amendment. The clerk will take the roll. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Members, we are now on discussion of the underlying A6 amendment as amended. I recognize the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Speaker Wolgamont. Well, very disappointing. Uh, I, I'm new to elections. I never served on the committee before until uh, this month. Uh, we've heard lots of bills. We've talked about lots of different aspects of elections and access to elections. I think all of us want people to vote. Uh, participation in our election system is a, pri a point of pride for the state of Minnesota. And people will take part more vigorously if they have confidence that the system is well run and that those voting are voting legally. Uh, this, to me, uh, indicates that we are encouraging them to vote illegally. Uh, Speaker Wogelman, I withdraw the amendment. Representative Torkelson withdraws the A6 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Ingen moves to amend House Law number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A9. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Anoka, Representative Ingen, to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, simply put, you know, the A9 amendment, it just ensures that our collective democracy is protected from individuals who have sought to diminish the safety, security, and the protected rights of others. This amendment simply excludes convicted persons who've engaged in terroristic threats, stalking, and predatorial harassment from engaging in our elections process before their full sentence is served. You know, when we first heard uh, Representative Frazier's bill that we are right now debating in the Public Safety Committee, we had heard testimony from a man who was convicted of rape harassment of several judges, law enforcement officials, stalked and threatened neighbors, a psychologist, 
an executive of a nonprofit organization, and even someone who shared his name. You know, we're still talking about the same man, mind you. He also created 400 websites in his victims' names. He repeatedly harassed them online, had restraining orders filed against him by a Hennepin County official, and even made terroristic threats to the family of his rape victim. In his testimony on this bill that we're debating right now, this man said, quote, I'm the poster boy for this bill. Members, if this amendment fails, that man who did everything that I just talked about can vote against the judge that he harassed, the prosecutor who was on his case, or the sheriff who helped investigate that case. Simply put, this is absurd. It's bad policy, and this amendment simply corrects that. I urge a green vote. There is an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. <clears throat> Frazier moves to amend the Ingham Amendment to House Bill number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment to the amendment is coded A16. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, essentially, this amendment to the amendment will replace when the individual sentence has expired or is fully discharged, it will replace it with the individual is no longer incarcerated for the offense. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start over. Uh, this amendment will replace when the individual sentence has expired or is fully discharged with the individual is no longer incarcerated for the offense. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, let me respond just a bit to Representative Ingham. Thank you for your, your comments. This is what I was concerned about in this debate. Uh, going into uh, taking one situation from one testifier, and what I will say is, this is the amazing thing about our democracy, that we create a public square for individuals to come in and testify and tell their story and to be heard. We heard all the individuals that came to testify on behalf and support of this bill. But I have not heard any of my colleagues on the other side talk about those stories. Now, we still have time, so maybe they will. But to this point, I have not. I have only heard stories with extreme facts to fear monger and scare folks. And that is not what our democracy is about. And this bill is about restoring, not dividing, not punishing, but about restoring the vote and the voice for individuals in our democracy. I would urge members to accept the amendment to the amendment. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Ingen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, um, Representative Frazier, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, but I think that this bill, as you just described it, truly is a one-size-fits-all model for a state that has multiple levels of criminal activity of all different kinds, and that's why this doesn't work. Because under the exact story that I just laid out, which were facts, by the way, that man was not, he had not fully served out his sentencing orders. He was still serving the sentencing for the rape, the terroristic threats, the harassment charges when he continued to do that. So. That's why, simply, simply put, members, we, we have to vote down this amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? Uh, I recognize the member from Minoka, Representative Scott. Mr. Speaker and Representative Frazier, um, we talked about this in judiciary, and I'm assuming it was probably talked about in public safety and other committees as well, and, and you were afraid, you, you stated that you were afraid that when this got to the House floor, um, that we would just give these, you know, one-off situations, these extreme situations. You're darn tootin'. We tried to talk about, let's make some exceptions for rape, for murder, for those sorts of things, and because the members on the other side of the aisle do not want to change anything that they're doing in a significant way on their bills, this is where we are. 
There are members of your body that are prosecutors that have looked after victim, victims' rights. And I heard in t the testimony from um, the domestic violence organizations and whatever that the victims are for this. I would like to know what data they used to say that. Did they interview all the victims? What about the dead victims? They aren't getting a voice in this. The members of this side of the aisle are all for second chances, but with limits. Give somebody, if, if they've been um, incarcerated and they get out, give them a year. If they, if they are good, upstanding citizens, they don't violate the conditions of their probation, then, then this bill would be great. But right now, it's it, it, like Representative, um, my fellow representative from Anoka County said, this is a one-size-fits-all, and it shouldn't be that way. The individual that he described should not be allowed to vote, not for the things that he's done. Vote no on the amendment to the amendment. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. I recognize the member from I say it to you, Representative Johnson. Mr. Speaker, members, Representative Frazier, what Representative Ingen talked about is not a one-off. I don't know who follows Minneapolis Crime Watch on Twitter, but I do. It's horrifying, some of the things that you see and what's going on, because our press don't report it. They don't want the people to know what's actually happening. Now, yesterday I went back and through their Twitter feed for the last two, two days. So the, all this information is three days old. And what's happened in those three days. Down in Rochester, Mohammed was convicted of sexually assaulting two girls, ages four and eight, multiple times. He was sentenced to 180 days. Yes, he got uh, quite a few years probation, but, a court, but the bill here that we were trying to fix would keep him from voting until he's done with probation. Finished his sentence. Instead, with the bill that we have before us, we don't amend it. He's not going to miss a single election, yet he destroyed the lives of two young girls. Another incident. Izell was recently released from the Department of Corrections after serving 11 of the 17-year sentence he received for criminal sexual first-degree criminal sexual assault two times, two separate charges plus kidnapping. He was released 2023. He's already been picked up on a DOC hold for a major violation, not a technical violation, a real violation of his uh, pr probation. and you want to let him vote. Oh, he has another criminal sexual assault uh, back a few years ago as well, that uh, before he's sentenced on the other two. He was on probation when he did the next round of criminal sexual assault, first degree. It's not a one-off. Then we have Charles. Multiple felonies, on probation, multiple warrants, Charged with burglary again. I'm glad I have a keypad locks and that they were invented for my house. My wife was a victim of burglary when she was young. If I go out the ho outside my house without my keys to mow the lawn, go get the mail, or just sit on my deck, I'm locked out of my house if my wife is home because she's that petrified to this day. And she was a young teenager when that happened. Then we have Patrick, Mankato area. 
26 prior convictions, nine felonies, and an open case for felon in possession of a firearm on probation for felony stalking. If you know the stalking laws, you, you have to have multiple stalking convictions before you get to felony level. This person was just picked up for, for providing phony oxycodone pills to three teenage girls. They had to use Narcon on them. One of them is still in critical condition. Yet that side of the aisle still wants to let him vote. This, in the la this stuff just happened this week, and there's a lot more of it. If you don't have any compassion for these victims that live with it for their entire life, and more convictions to the people that are hurting them, this state's in a lot of trouble. Please vote against the Frazier Amendment. Mr. Speaker. I recognize Representative Doubt. Rise to a point of order, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Sp uh, Representative Doubt, state your point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to a point of order under Mason Section 410, Part 3, which states that a motion to strike out words in one place and to insert words in a different effect in another place is not in order because it constitutes two amendments that should be submitted separately. Uh, this particular amendment, and actually the previous two, uh, are both uh, violations of that particular rule in Masons. Um, these, you know, we are only, uh, a motion to amend is a, is a, is a primary motion. Uh, uh, a motion to amend that is a secondary. Um, and, a, and a motion of the third degree is a motion to amend a, an amendment. Uh, or excuse me, a motion to amend the amendment to the amendment, which we do not allow and they're out of order. Um, this one would need to be two separate amendments um, according to that section of Masons. Um, we don't allow uh, motions of the third degree or amendments of the third degree in this chamber. We never have. Uh, this one is a, uh, uh, a motion that clearly is in violation of Masons and should have been uh, submitted as two separate motions. And I can read that for you again if you like, Mr. Speaker. Members, is there any advice to Representative Dowd's point of order? I recognize the member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I advise you to find the point of order not well taken. Uh, there is not a uh, striking out different words in another place. We are striking words and inserting it in the same place. So you should find the point of order not well taken. Mr. Speaker, further, further advice, advice, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will point to the actual amendment to the amendment. It is coded A16. Uh, it is an amendment to the Engen Amendment, coded A9. Uh, if you'll look at page, uh, excuse me, line 1.3, page 1, line 2, delete everything after A. So that's one place in the bill. That's on, on uh, page 1, line 2. That's in one place. And then in a separate place, You'll, you'll note that uh, we're inserting language on page one, line six. So page one, line two is a different place than page one, line six. So we're very obviously deleting language on page one, line two in this amendment to the amendment. And then in the same amendment to the amendment, we're inserting language uh, page one, line six. So I don't know how the majority leader believes those are in the same place in this amendment, but obviously this is a violation of our Mason's manual. Are there any other members wishing to offer advice on the doubt point of order? I recognize the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, very clear. Uh, if you read Mason's and compare the rule to the amendment to the amendment, uh, there's very little doubt that uh, that this uh, speaker, uh, member Doubt, has uh, identified a violation of Masons. Thank you. Members, I have reviewed the amendment to the amendment and the underlying amendment and the previous amendments to the amendment and amendments. 
I have considered advice from Representative Doubt, Representative Long, Representative Torkelson. I have reviewed the rule, and I find that Representative Doubt's point of order is not well taken. Mr. Speaker. Representative Doubt, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to overturn the ruling of the Speaker, and I request a roll call vote. Representative Doubt moves to overturn the ruling of the Speaker and requests a roll call vote. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Representative Doubt, discussion to the appeal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I know this is a rule that we probably haven't talked about here on the floor, but um, always uh, good advice to get yourself a copy of Mason's manual and read it. Uh, Mason's is uh, the manual of legislative procedure that has uh, been uh, published by the National Conference of State Legislatures. It is in our precedence of uh, consideration um, as one of the, the tools that we use to judge the orderly operation of this chamber. I will draw your attention uh, to uh, section 410, an amendment by inserting words, uh, part three. And that clearly reads, a motion to strike out words in one place and to insert words into a different, uh, to, excuse me, to insert words to a different effect in another place is not in order because it constitutes two amendments that should be submitted separately. Um, this is very clear. If you read the amendment to the amendment, um, and I just went through it for the speaker, but I'm happy for those that weren't in the chamber or not paying attention to uh, review it again for you. Um, on, uh, in this amendment to the amendment, and I'm looking at uh, the amendment to the amendment, it's the pink sheets, A16, coded A16. It is an amendment to the Engen Amendment, coded A9. On line 1.3, that reads page one, line two, delete everything after A. So if you go back to the amendment, uh, page one, line two, delete everything after A. So we're deleting things on line two, and then we're inserting different language to a different effect in a different place in the bill, which is what it says in Mason's, that you cannot do. A motion to strike out words in one place and to insert words into a different, excuse me, to a different effect in another place is not in order because it constitutes two amendments that should be submitted separately. So members, uh, this is uh, uh, something that uh, we very obviously um, need to make sure that we're conducting our, our body and our chamber according to rules of order here. Mason's manual is something that we use, um, and, and this is something that we've gotten a little uh, astray of here in the, in the chamber by allowing uh, amendments that, that basically rewrite a whole underlying amendment all in one amendment. Um, this is clearly out of order. Uh, this isn't something that we should do. You certainly can do this if you want, but you have to do it in two separate amendments. Um, and that's pretty clear under Mason's manual. So, uh, members, I would just request that you brush up on your Mason's manual, uh, read the amendment, read the underlying amendment, and, uh, you know, isn't it fun that we actually legislate here on the fly? So, uh, please vote with me. I think it's pretty obvious that this is out of order. Um, I would ask you to vote red, which will overrule the ruling of the speaker. Thank you. Any further discussion to the appeal? I recognize the member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would ask members to uphold your ruling. Is there any further discussion to the appeal? Seeing none, oh, I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just say, I mean, come on. Thank you, Representative Doubt. Um, and thank you for being so clear in citing to us the rule um, in Mason's manual. And I'm sorry, thank you for the advice to the body, the very clear advice to the body on why we should vote against the ruling of the speaker. And frankly, if the majority party is going to disagree with that, they can at least make an argument. They can at least try to convince us. I mean, what a farce that all you do is stand up and say, just vote with the speaker. Come on, what is happening? Further discussion to the appeal. I recognize the member from Morrison, Representative Kreshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, members and, and Representative Doubt and Representative New. Absolutely agree. I mean, the majority party, you have the votes. That doesn't mean you just shirk your duties and not make the arguments. 
you have to provide to the speaker, and the, and the speaker's role is to listen to both of those arguments and actually put this back to the will of the body. Simply saying, don't do this, is not a clear argument of why this is a violation. This is very clearly a violation of just taking one word, putting it into another amendment to change the effect, to simply uh, change the desired voting outcome. And that is incorrect, is an incorrect usage of our amendment process, and frankly, uh, it's just not right. You're going to have the votes, you're going to win this anyway, but if you can't win it with good arguments, that just seems to be a lazy way to legislate. Is there any further discussion to the appeal? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the appeal. And I'll remind members that a green vote supports the ruling of the speaker and no red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. The clerk will take the roll. The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 60 nays, it is the, is the judgment of the House that the decision of the Speaker shall stand. Members, we are now on the underlying, or excuse me, we are now back to discussion of the A-16 Frazier Amendment to the A-9 Ingen Amendment. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment, I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Moeller. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I wanted to stand up here to address some of the comments that have been made about victims and what they may or may want, want May, what they may or may not want. I am somebody who has worked with victims for over 20 years um, as a prosecutor, but also a victim rights advocate. I was the executive director of the Minnesota Alliance on Crime, which is the General Crime Victim Coalition. And this issue came up about 10 years ago, actually. We were asked, because this has been around for a long time, and we were asked at that time, what would victims think about? How do victims think about restore the vote? And so we did a survey of our member programs at the time, and there was overwhelming support in favor of restore the vote, and that was 10 years ago. Members, in your packet, you have a letter of support here from the crime victim coalitions across the state, Violence Free Minnesota, Minnesota Alliance on Crime, Minnesota, uh, uh, coalition Against Sexual Assault, and the Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. These coalitions work with victims in every single corner of this state, in all our counties and the tribes. They are in full support of this bill. And there's a good reason why they are in full support of this bill and, uh, and would oppose this um, amendment that was being proposed here. And that's because People, when they are um, out after incarceration, they are part of the community. And as they said in their letter here, restoring voting rights for formerly incarcerated individuals <laughs> is also a violence prevention strategy. I have not once in my 20 plus years of practice ever heard a victim say, you know what I really want that punishment to be? I don't want that offender to be able to vote again. Victims want consequences, that is true, but voting is not one of those consequences. And um, for that reason, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm completely forgotten now what we're on, the amendment to the amendment. <laughs> are we on the underlying amendment now? Uh, Representative Moeller, we are currently discussing the A16 amendment submitted by Representative Frazier to amend the A9 Ingen amendment. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I support Representative Frazier's amendment, encourage members to as well. Thank you. Any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? 
I recognize the member from Minoka, Representative Ingen. You know, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just request a roll call vote on this. Representative Ingen has requested a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we've had sort of a lengthy rules uh, discussion again, but I just want to bring this back. What we were told by the author of the amendment to the amendment is we're bringing up these extreme one-off examples. Well, that's clearly not the case because we've got a whole list of them, and, we, and that was just from the last few days. We can come up with an extensive list. Some people would call this extreme one-off examples. We would actually just call them facts, and we should make our decisions based on facts. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Members, we are now on the A9 Ingen Amendment as amended. Is there any discussion? I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Minoka, Representative Ingen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm extremely disheartened in our body's uh, affirmation of restoring these rights, the voting rights, participating in democracy prior to full discharge of a sentence. So um, I repeal my amendment as, amend as amended. I would withdraw. Representative Ingen withdraws the A9 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Ingen moves to amend House File Number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A7. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Minoka, Representative Ingen, to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, the A7 amendment uh, ensures that we as a body give a voice to the voiceless, that we protect the thousands of Minnesotans who are victims of the most heinous crimes in our state. These are our brothers, these are sisters, these are our neighbors, constituents, who had their voice taken from them. For victims of sexual assault and murder, we must unequivocally say that we stand with you, that we will not allow your voice to be forever silenced, yet uplift the voice of the assailant even before full sentence served. This amendment simply disqualifies convicted murderers and rapists from stealing the dignity, the dignity of their victims while continuing to have their own in our democratic process. I ask for a roll call vote on this. Representative Ingen requests a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. There is an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. Frazier moves to amend the Ingen amendment to House File number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment to the amendment is called A15. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, simply for this amendment to the amendment, we'll strike the language and then add language that says the individual was no longer incarcerated for the offense. Uh, they will be allowed uh, to vote. L let, me, let me just restate. Again, taking the most egregious situations and using those to divide and fearmonger. We have a criminal justice system. Individuals are held accountable. And then that system says, you are now deemed safe to go back into the community, be with your family, get a job, 
pay taxes, abide by the laws, the laws that we make in here, but currently that system says you cannot participate in your democracy, a representative democracy. And I just heard someone in this body said they're disappointed that we want to give the right to vote to individuals. They're disappointed that we want to give a voice to individuals in our democracy. That is the opposite of what we should be doing here. I urge you to vote on my amendment to the amendment in the affirmative. Further discussion to the amendment to the amendment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise um, in opposition to the amendment to the amendment supporting the Engen Amendment. It has been said multiple times um, so far this evening that we are pointing out things that are egregious. And members, I am sorry to say, we are pointing out things that are honestly the most common, and especially regarding this amendment, where we're talking about felony offenses for murder or criminal sexual conduct once the sentence um, has been um, carried out in prison, but they still have probation to go. In 2019, um, there was the highest number of mitigated dispositional departures ever observed in our state. 40% members. So this is not egregious, this is common. In 2019, first degree aggravated robbery, second degree aggravated assault, possession of child pornography, third degree criminal sexual conduct, fourth degree criminal sex conduct, failure to register as a predatory offender, and felony with a gun offense, received probation instead of prison 37% of the time. So members, people aren't going to prison and getting out on probation. They're not going to prison. The only thing they're getting for these very serious crimes is probation. They have not served their sentence or showed the community that they are necessarily rehabilitated or, or paid their debt to society. They are not even going to prison. So members, I just encourage you, um, another stat is 28% of the time in 2019, 28% of criminal sexual conduct offenses were um, given a, dis a mitigated dispositional departure. So all the other ones I listed, in addition to that, 28% of the time the criminal sex cases were given probation only, not prison. And yet the other side of the um, aisle is willing to say you don't have to um, really have a consequence. You can just keep going ahead and vote. And members, I, I don't think Minnesota supports that. I really don't think our communities where people are not feeling safe and there's been an uptick in crime would support that people do not, who have not served any time, just get to go ahead and vote as if nothing happened. So members, I urge you to support the Engen Amendment. I recognize the member from Clearwater, Representative Grossel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, listening to the, the debate tonight and the, uh, the fight against and the lack of uh, accepting anything that is reasonable from the majority party as far as trying to work together, trying to find common ground, trying to make sure that people who, uh, who, who serve their time have the opportunity to start voting again. And our current law, our current law sits right now that after a felon is uh, done with all of, their, all of their time, the majority of them do receive their right to vote. So they are not, they are not kept from voting forever. They are not kept from voting forever. A colleague over there, Rep. Fraser, uh, talks about we bring up the most egregious of, of offenses. Well, folks, they are some of the most egregious offenses, and they do happen all too often. They do happen all too often. Now, we have a cap on probation. We have a cap on probation. And I just heard my colleague up there, Representative Robbins, talk about the amount, the number of cases recently that have been stayed, stayed sentences. So with a stayed sentence, it is my understanding that with a stayed sentence, 
uh, the probation cap falls into, comes into play, and that is five years. That is five years. So these, these folks who have committed these crimes, crimes of violence against other people, and some of which these, these victims, their voice has been silenced forever, they don't, get, they don't get to vote anymore. They don't get to have a say. They don't get to have a say in our voting, our voting system anymore in this democracy. I think it's only fitting, and with Minnesota again being a very low incarceration state, with Minnesota again having probation caps on state sentences, I think Minnesota is doing pretty good as far as uh, trying to work people back into society, trying to help them to come back along and show that, yes, I've done my time. I've paid my debt to society. I think we can all agree that is something that we would like to see happen. But there are those who, because of the egregious crime that they have committed against your neighbors and mine, that time should be extended to a degree. I've heard my a colleague over there, Representative Frazier, talk about this is uh, not having the right to vote is cause, uh, is cause for some of them to reoffend. That should, that should raise a little bit of alarm in all of us that if that's all it takes for someone to want to commit another egregious felony crime against another human being, I would say we should probably pump the brakes on this one, folks. We have offered and tried to work together, and we continue to offer and try to work together. Representative Frazier says he wants accountability. So do I. None of us disagree on that. But to just to open the door and say, hey, come on. Come on and vote. And the last I checked, you know, so, so many of these victims, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of victims in a lot of these areas who are people of color who have suffered this. And that was one of the things that my colleague said, that this is disproportionate as far as those who have committed these crimes, as far as not being allowed to vote. Well, what about those victims? What about their victims? It's disproportionate to not take into consideration their lives lost, their families' pain and suffering. So all this is asking is, is just listen. And let's find some good working ground to allow to, to get people back into society. I say vote no on the uh, underlying uh, amendment to the amendment from Representative Fraser. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? I recognize the member from Minoka, Representative Ingen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, guys, we, members, we are voting right now on whether someone can murder another, permanently denying their rights and their voice for forever yet restoring the voting rights of their murderer before full discharge of their sentence. Members, I urge you to vote no on the amendment to the amendment, and I request a roll call. Representative Ingen requests a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Is there any further discussion to the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, the motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Yeah. Members, we are now on the A7 Ingen Amendment as amended. Is there any further discussion to this amendment? I recognize the member from Minoka, the author of the amendment, Representative Ingen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm extremely disheartened at uh, this body not remembering the voices of the victims. I withdraw my amendment, please. Representative Ingen withdraws the A7 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Torkelson moves to amend House File number 28, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A12. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson, to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment creates a felony for interfering with or intimidating an election official, and I believe there's an amendment to the amendment at the desk. Mr. Speaker? Representative Olson, for what purpose do you rise? I rise to a point of order under House Rule 4.05. Representative Olson, state your point of order. Under House Rule 4.05, an amendment to a bill that has received its second reading and is being considered by the House of out of order if that amendment would increase spending. And because the amendment is going to create a felony, there would be a cost associated with this amendment. Is there any advice on the Olson point of order? I recognize the member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I noted the amendment to the amendment. I don't know why you couldn't have recognized that. Is there any further advice? I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I am, I've, it's a short amendment, so I've quickly read the amendment, and I don't see any additional spending in here. And again, you know, we've had this discussion before. The rule very specifically uh, um, relates to increasing spending in a bill. There is n literally no spending in this bill. It spends zero dollars. So this, I, I would encourage the speaker to find the point of order not well taken. Members, I have reviewed the bill and the amendment and the rule. I have considered advice from Representative Olson, Representative Torkelson, and Representative New Brindley, and I find that the point of order is Mr. well taken. Mr. Speaker, I repeal the ruling of the speaker. Representative Damoth requests an appeal to the ruling. Representative roll Damoth call. moves an appeal to the ruling of the speaker and requests a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Representative Damoth, any discussion to your appeal? Yes, Mr. Speaker, um, Rule 4.05 that was raised um, talks about additional spending. As you can clearly see in this amendment, um, there is no additional spending at all. And I'm happy to read th through this if you would like. But the, in no line on the amendment in front of me that is in front of the body right now is there additional spending. My member had also raised the point that there is an underlying amendment, but we're not on that right now, and so I would find, I would ask that you would find my advice well taken. Is there any further discussion to Representative Damoth's appeal? I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Mr. Speaker, advice to the body. Um, members, I've been here for more than eight years. It's custom and usage that whenever there's a felony that's created an amendment, uh, that is presumed to have a cost, as we've said, um, uh, and to increase spending. As we've said in the past, if this were int introduced as a bill, there'd be a fiscal note, there'd be increased spending because of it. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the speaker ruled correctly in terms of violation of 4.05, and I would uh, ask that we uphold that ruling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any further discussion? I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems crazy that we keep having the same conversation, and yet every time the majority party stands to uh, a point of order under Rule 4.05, they continue to use the word cost. They say it over and over and over again. This costs money. This costs money. Frankly, it's irrelevant. I don't know that it even would cost money, but it's irrelevant because that's not what Rule 4.05 says. 
Rule 4.05 is very clearly referring to an appropriation, to spending, not cost, spending. Rule 4.405, the House is, or, 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 an amendment being considered by the House is out of order if that amendment would increase the spending. Increase the spending. There is no appropriation in this bill. There is no spending money in this bill. I would encourage the body to rule against the ruling of the speaker. I recognize the member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I did scan the amendment. I did not even see the word nickel in there, so I think we're still good. But I, I think I'm gonna encourage the members of the majority if you're gonna to try to rule stuff out of order or you're gonna play reindeer games on the floor, do it properly. There's no appropriation here. Representative New Brindley is exactly right and so are the others. There's not anything spent on this, nothing. And as somebody who has, unlike Representative Torkelson who's brand new to the elections thing, you guys talk about all the time you have brought so many bills to committee to say, we have to protect the elections workers, we have to do everything we can. Well, here's your chance, here's your chance. But you want to play gimmicks and reindeer games to say that this actually spends money. There's not a dollar sign on this amendment. Nothing. So I, I, am, I am really disappointed that you try to, to play procedural gimmicks. And that's what it is. You just don't want to take a vote. You don't want to take a hard vote. And for all of you over there giggling, thinking that this is amusing, it's not. This is deadly serious. So you, on a regular basis, bring forward things that talk about ways to protect elections workers. Once again, Representative Torkelson's amendment is an ideal opportunity for you to find the backbone and do the right thing on behalf of the elections workers. There is no appropriation in this at all. The speaker knows that, but apparently he's been given marching orders to find that it is out of order because of some mythic spending somewhere. Mr. Speaker, point of order. Representative Pinto, state your point of order. Mr. Speaker, um, questioning motives of members, certainly questioning motives of the presiding officer <clears throat> is uh, prohibited, <clears throat> pardon me, under Masons. Uh, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I will note that this creates a felony that has always, always been uh, ruled out of order under 4.05 in my experience in this chamber. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will remind members to confine their remarks to the question before the body, which is, an appeal to the ruling of the speaker and not to evoke the motives of members or the presiding officer. Further discussion to the appeal. I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. First of all, thank you, Representative Pinto. I almost rose to the same point of order and we, you know, there have been many instances of that today, but this is advice to the body. Members, I've been here a few years, and we have never, in the application of this rule, never required there be dollar signs in an amendment. Spending is spending. If, you, if we in, um, create a new felony here on the House floor, there will be spending to implement that law. And so it, there doesn't have to, it doesn't have to have an appropriation in the amendment to violate this rule. So for example, if we had an amendment here on the House floor to build a building and we wouldn't appropriate anything for it, be like, well, let's build a nice building here in an amendment. We don't have to put in an appropriation for it. We won't be, yep. pretend it doesn't cost something. It does cost something, and it would be spending in an amendment, and it would be out of order as this amendment is out of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion to the appeal. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I, I want to uh, make two points. One is, uh, by voting for, to uphold the ruling of the Speaker, I, I want to make clear that every one of you is uh, voting for the fact that this is happening and shouldn't be a felony. If it's not happening, no cost. No cost to, to calling something a felony if it's not happening. So if you think it's out of order because of the cost, then th what you're saying is uh, it's happening but it shouldn't be a felony, or we shouldn't have the opportunity to make it a felony. Um, second, I do want to, I haven't been here as long as, as some other members for sure, but I do want to caution 
the entire body, not to play fast and loose with the distinction between cost and appropriation when it suits one party's interest and not the other. And I want to return us to the debate we had a week ago. There were a number of provisions in the bill that we debated a week ago that made the, made the Public Utilities Commission do things that were going to have a cost, and, uh, and in particular, made the, uh, is going to make the Attorney General do something, namely defend against a lawsuit that we know is coming from North Dakota that is going to have a cost. That bill never went to the Ways and Means Committee because it didn't have any appropriations in it. So we need to be very, very careful. Our rules do distinguish between costs and appropriations. When things have costs, they need to go through Ways and Means. That didn't go through Ways and Means because it didn't have appropriations, even though it did have costs. So we are setting a very bad precedent in this body, members, if we distinguish between costs and, appro and appropriations in a way that is purely partisan. So please, I uh, urge you to overturn the ruling of the speaker. I recognize the member for Mysanti, Representative Dowd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and members uh, appreciate the input on this. Uh, it's actually just easy enough to read the rule. Um, you know, and, and it's pretty obvious if you, if you read the rule uh, what it says. Um, it, even, it even talks about uh, the appropriation, uh, increasing the base in the appropriation. Um, and and I, I think it's funny to hear a member of the other side of the aisle tell me that this body never passes anything that's not covered with an appropriation. We do it all the time. And if, if we don't, if we instruct somebody to do something, and we don't provide an appropriation, that means they cover it within their current budget. And, and the difference between cost and spending or appropriation is absolutely valid. And this particular rule doesn't mention cost. And I appreciate uh, the representative from the Rochester area uh, standing and, and talking about uh, uh, this particular issue, but you can talk about how this rule has been misused since, you know, until the cows come home. It doesn't make it right. I can still read the rule as my colleagues have correctly read the rule and we can see that there's no appropriation. Now, if you want to go through a dog and pony show, I can ask a parliamentary inquiry and ask the, the presiding officer to point out to me where the appropriation is in this bill and he will say, well, I don't see any appropriation of dollars in this bill. I could ask each of you to yield for a question. I could say, could you point out for me in this amendment where the appropriation is? There is no appropriation in this bill. Therefore, it has no spending. This bill spends no money because there is no appropriation. And, it, and you know, four years now you've been misusing this rule that still doesn't make it right. Every time you say or create a felony, we rule it out of order under this rule. Yeah, you do. And every time we bring up this point that you're misusing the rule. So why don't we actually just follow the rule? Because it very clearly says spending. And we know in this body that spending is an appropriation. This amendment doesn't spend one penny. Maybe Representative Liebling could yield for a question for me. She will yield, Representative Dowd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Liebling, maybe you can point out the appropriation in this bill. Where is that appropriation? I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Dowd, maybe you weren't listening when I spoke. I think I clearly said you don't need an appropriation under the rule. And getting mad and the louder you say it, the more often you say it, doesn't change that. So. We don't need an appropriation. There is spending in the amendment. Representative Dowd. No, I think what you meant to say is you don't need a, 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 an appropriation to rule it that way. But the reality is the rule is pretty clear. And it doesn't talk about cost. It does talk about appropriation. And spending is appropriation. It literally uses the word appropriation. So this bill doesn't appropriate, this amendment, excuse me, I keep saying bill. This amendment doesn't appropriate any dollars. It has no cost. No additional cost. And therefore, it's absolutely in order. But we can continue this for the rest of this session. 
Um, it's easier actually if we just consider the stuff. I think people, I think this, this right here is what frustrates people at home, right? They want us to just do the people's work. If you have an idea, you offer it as a bill. If we have something that we think makes your idea better, we offer it as amendment. If you don't think so, vote it down. Don't offer an amendment to change our idea back into your idea. That's stupid. But that's what we do here. And that's why people at home get frustrated with what we do here. But if that's the way you want to do it, let's continue to do it that way then. But it's not going to make it right because it is a violation of our rules and it's a clear violation of our rules. Thank you. Is there any further discussion to the appeal? I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, yeah. th thank yeah. you, Speaker. Yeah. And, and I did want to point out, if you go to 4.05, um, it says, would increase the spending or spending base from any fund from which appropriations are made in that bill. It does say that. But then the word or appears. And it says, or would increase the spending in total from all funds. And so I think the um, existence of the clause after or suggests that there would be a time that this would apply other than when there is a direct appropriation in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. I, I'm a simple person. And so I boil this down to we have fiscal, we have policy committees. I have not seen a policy bill that didn't have a cost. So in fiscal bills, we're appropriating money. In policy bills, we're defining the activities of, of the government agencies, and that has a cost. Every minute a person is doing something that's in our policy bill, that's a cost. You know, I, I don't understand. You're pushing the idea in such a fashion that you want the SOP to be any bill that has a cost would have to be treated like a fiscal bill. And, and frankly, that's wrong. It's pretty simple and straightforward, policy, fiscal. But I guess I'm just a simple person looking at the rules. You will vote how you wish to vote. Um, I just don't understand it. Is there any further discussion to the appeal? I recognize the member from Wright, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, would Representative Becker Fenn yield to a question? She will yield, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Becker Fenn, I'm just trying to understand uh, the point you just made clearly. Uh, are you suggesting that this body, through a bill, can increase overall spending without an appropriation? I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Becker Fenn. Uh, no, I am not. Representative Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn. I don't understand what the point was then, because if we can't increase overall spending without an appropriation, and we don't have an appropriation here, then it's not a spending situation. So the rule doesn't apply. Thank you. Is there any further discussion to the appeal? I recognize the member from Stearns, the Minority Leader, Representative Damon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Olson yield for a question? She will yield for a question. Representative Damon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Olson, could you tell me if there's a fiscal note for this amendment? I recognize the member from St. Louis, Representative Olson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. If this were to have been introduced as a bill, and I do believe portions of this are in a Representative Greenman bill that does have a fiscal note and cost associated, associated with it. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that information, Representative Olson. Um, members, as we are deciding to overturn the ruling of the Speaker, I just want to point out that in this 
bill, the actual bill, uh, the fiscal note came back with $13,000 in general fund costs to the Secretary of State's office for IT, business analysis, quality assurance costs. Um, of the $16,415 total, or $16,450 total, the Secretary of State's office stated that they could absorb $3,530 from the HAVA funds. So members, as we are debating whether or not to overturn the ruling of the speaker, again, we want to point out that in this amendment, there is no spending. If there were, it could be absorbed, but there is no spending. Members, I would ask you to vote in favor of overturning the ruling of the speaker. Is there any further discussion to the appeal? Before I instruct the clerk to take the roll on the appeal, I would like to remind the body that the question before us is, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? And just to clarify, members, a yes or green vote supports the ruling of the speaker, while a no or red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. The clerk will take the roll on the appeal. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the ruling of the Speaker shall stand. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House file number 28. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Hollins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, Thank you to members of this body. I really appreciated the discussion today. Um, I know that we're all just trying to tackle this very complex issue in a respectful way, and I appreciate that. I wanna kinda dial back a little bit and focus on something a little more fundamental. I wanna think about our criminal justice system. Uh, we know that human beings are complex creatures. They're not simply bad guys and good guys. Even comic book movies nowadays recognize that we're more complicated than that. There are many, many reasons why people may commit crimes. Um, ignorance, heat of the moment, um, desperation. And I'll also point out that certain communities are more heavily policed, more frequently charged, and more harshly judged than other communities, simply because of the color of their skin or their socioeconomic status. But I believe that people can change. I think we can become better we can learn, we can mature, we can become more empathetic. And because of this, I think that rehabilitation must be the ultimate objective of our criminal justice system. That means our ultimate goal is to rehabilitate an offender so they're capable of returning to society and functioning as a law-abiding member of our communities. And part of returning to society means being allowed to function as a fully restored human being. Voting is one of the most fundamental and quintessential rights of our country. I am certain you all remember the idea of no taxation without representation. Well, that's exactly what we're doing to people, people who have committed felonies. And I would argue that denying individuals the right to vote is downright un-American. These individuals are our neighbors, they are our friends, they are our family members. They've served their time. They've been deemed safe enough to return to our communities. Former felons are productive members of our societies. They are contributing to our communities and they are paying taxes. They deserve the right to vote. Please 
vote green. Thank you. I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. We've repeatedly heard how a huge portion of the people convicted of felonies, some very serious crimes, are serving probation. And that we, are, we don't have a hard, large proportionality of people incarcerated. So who are the incarcerated? Disproportionately, the poor and the unconnected. While the rich that can afford great lawyers or the connected get probation. This disparity is injustice. And this bill might feel good, but it increases the injustice of the system. So instead of doing something, it feels good, it feels right, we're delaying the fixing of the system, the core reason of the injustice in the sentencing. If people are serving in incarceration and they are there because they didn't have or could not afford the lawyer that could have gotten a sweetheart deal, it's injustice to increase that disparity by saying the rich connected people that got the sweetheart deal, you get your right to vote back, even though your sentence hasn't been completed. But the poor person sitting in prison doesn't, because their sentence is all here incarcerated. The people that serve not one day in prison, out on probation, their sentence is probation, they're out, and they get the right to vote back because they're special. I think instead of focusing on this, we should focus on the core issue with the sentencing and the justice system and fix the injustice, not in expand the injustice with this bill. I like the intent. I like the enthusiasm. But it should be focused on the core issue. Because too many times we fix something in a Band-Aid and we don't realize that it actually makes it worse. And I've already talked to the author and we're going to get together and see what we can do on the core issue. But I personally cannot vote for this because it expands that unfair disparity in treatment. And I, I refuse to do that. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Igbadje. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise in support of this bill. Uh, we heard earlier the history of voting rights in this country and ways in which voting rights have been used to exclude varied groups from participating in our society. From the very beginning, like men without property, women, immigrants, and people of color. Today we have an opportunity to restore the right to vote to people who were formerly incarcerated who reside in all of our communities. When I'm in conversation with members in my district, I come across people who tell me, well, everything you're saying sounds really good, but I can't vote. Some of those people are so disenchanted with our society, they don't want anything to do with it. But others are angry and sad. They tell me how they're getting their lives back on track after their release. They tell me how they're involved with their communities, engaged with their kids, and working. They tell me how they would like to be involved but their lack of their ability to vote makes them feel like they aren't full members in our society. They're doing everything right, yet they can't vote for something like school board 
and ensure that their voice and their opinions about their school are taken into account. If you're a citizen of this country and you've served your time and you've been deemed safe to be back in society, your right to vote should be restored. We want to promote behavior that will keep people engaged. And one way that people do that is by having a voice in their community through their vote. So I'm very glad to lend my support to this bill. And one thing I want to make sure that we're recognizing is that people who commit a crime have made a mistake. And when they're released, that mistake should not live with them forever. If you have served your time and are back living among us, you should not have that stigma and shame because of something you did in your past. You should have the second chance to rebuild your life and participate in your community in a similar way that others around you do. Your right to vote should be restored once you have been returned to society. So I want to end by thanking all the community members and legislators who have worked on this bill, especially here today, former Representative Ray Dean, and of course, Representative Cedric Fraser for carrying this bill tonight. Thank you for your commitment to our citizens and ensuring that they can fully reintegrate into our society. Members, I urge you to vote green. The member from Hennepin, Representative Finke. Sorry, the member from Ramsey, Representative Finke. <laughs> Thank you. It's my first time, so I'm glad that we got it correct on the record. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, in a recent committee hearing, Representative Frederick uh, told one of our testifiers that stories can change the world, so I just thought I would share a story here tonight. Um, I wanted to take a moment and tell a story about my friend Cecily. I met Cecily last winter at Warby Parker. She sold me these glasses. Um, and what, during that time, um, we chatted, and I told her that I was a candidate for office, uh, which intrigued her. She had done election work a decade earlier, quite a lot of it, actually, and she wanted to know what my race was all about. So we met. Uh, she got involved. And it, I learned very quickly that uh, this is a brilliant woman that I was so lucky to have had a chance encounter with at the Warby Parker in Minneapolis. I could tell she had so much to teach me, and she really has. And she is today a dear friend and a fierce advocate, and she is a felon. She's also watching this debate tonight. She told me that prior to moving to Minnesota, she believed that politics had been taken from her forever. One more thing that Rikers would have taken from her. She thought election work was out of her life. We keep hearing tonight about crimes, about vile and vicious crimes that people commit, um, but that's not what we're debating tonight. Tonight we're debating about people and the right of people to vote. That is a fundamental right of our citizens. It is not something that can be taken away by a crime. A person is not a crime. This is about people like my friend Cecily, who deserves to have her right to vote. So thank you, Representative Frederick, for bringing this. And I urge you to vote green. The member from Isanti, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, I rise and oppose this bill. Now, I don't want to be uh, in the same category as Representative Erdahl, but I'm going to give a little history lesson on uh, probation. Minnesota became a state in uh, 1858, and we did not have probation when our Constitution was written. Right around 1900, we started probation for juveniles, giving them an opportunity to turn their lives around. Some were in, couldn't get the right dates, but we believe it was somewhere between the 1940s and 1950s, we started probation 
for adults. The entire state had 37 probation agents in the late 60s. Since that time, Minnesota has now become tied for the second lowest incarceration rate in the country. Most of our incarceration is not in prisons or county jails. For those of you that work in the uh, law enforcement world, we call it on paper. It means you're on probation. In 1981, the current statute that we're talking about changing was actually written. And it doesn't say your right to vote. It says your rights. Not one right. It dealt with three different things that you were, were restricted from doing until your debt to, to society was fulfilled. And that debt to, debt to society is your entire sentence, your time in prison, and your time on probation. Yes, we had long probation, but that's been changed. Now we are capped at five years, except for a few items, a few different crimes. But it's usually five years or less now. Rep rep as long as we're talking about, rep about probation, Representative Otney, will you yield for a quick question? He will yield. Representative Johnson. Representative Novotny, uh, we've had the conversation before. I know I have dealt with it, stopped many people that are on probation. But have you ever stopped and talked to somebody on probation that did not know the date they were off paper? The member from Sherburne, Representative Novotny. Speaker Hartman, Representative Johnson, no. Representative Johnson. That's correct. Everybody knows when they're off paper and we're done with their probation. It's a date they celebrate. Now, earlier I talked about four individuals that are on probation, still committing crimes, that occurred in the last three days. Although Representative uh, Frazier called it the one that uh, Representative Ingen talked about is a one-off. It's not. It's continuously day after day after day by people on probation continuing to co commit crimes and violent crimes. But I'm going to get back to when our current statute was written. There was three things that included with that S after rights. Voting was one of them. Being able to sit on a jury was another one. And the third one was your right to bear firearms. We're changing that now. You do not, no longer have to fulfill and complete your debt to society if you commit a felony. I have problems with that. I know we have these groups that say they support the victims and they support this bill. How about talk to the victims to find out what's going on? Maybe talk to the parents of the three girls in Mankato. They might have a different story especially when they find out the person had multiple convictions and multiple felonies and was on probation, giving those girls fentanyl. Representative Hollins, I agree with you. I want every community, community to be safe. But just because they can supposedly vote doesn't make them safe. Law enforcement is doing their best to try to make every neighborhood 
across this state safe. But unfortunately, the attack on law enforcement over the last five years, they're no, no longer proactively trying to stop crime before it occurs. They are now responding after the crime happens. And it's only going to get worse. So I have no problem having them be able to vote once their debt to society is completed. Because we have many felonies that you'd never spend a day behind bars. In fact, on average, it takes somewhere between three to five burglaries before you even go to prison. Before you go, before you sent one day under the control of the Department of Corrections, you'll do it. At, you might do a first offense. You might do 30 days in the county jail and be on probation for two years. But it takes three to five before you actually get into the Department of Corrections. And unfortunately, we now have many prosecutors that are even even refusing to do a felony because it might interrupt some of their rights. What about the rights of the victims that have to live with the effects of a sexual assault for their entire life? The families in my communities, the family of Nick Inger was shot and killed watching them do drifting in Minneapolis. They still haven't found the person that killed him. These families live every day of their lives because of the acts of a few that you want to give them their rights back before they finish their debt to society. Members, please vote against this bill. The member from St. Louis, Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Buju Ozawa, Anakwad, Magazine and Dorem, Masabi Khan, and Dun Jabam, Kichin No Gomeng, Dagajiban, Dun Jaba. I'm not going to translate that because my ancestors know what I said, but I rise today because of my ancestors, and I rise today for my grandmas and my aunties, my siblings, and my relatives. And I stand up and I speak today for your loved ones, for your neighbors, for your siblings, for your relatives too. As Representative John Lewis said, the right to vote is precious. It is sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool that we have in a democracy. Voting is sacred. My people know that deeply. Native Americans were not allowed to become citizens until 1924. And the right to vote for us has been an uphill battle for Natives and Alaska Natives. And we weren't even universally granted the right to vote until the 1960s. Let that sink in, the 1960s. Furthermore, disenfranchising people with felony convicted, convictions um, is actually a tactic that was used by white supremacists after the Civil War to prevent black men from influencing elections, and thus by systemically stopping a large number of black and brown people from exercising their right to vote. The government itself and other people were able to thwart our folks from voting and thus preserving an existing power structure that also drew us into this criminal legal system and has rendered us incapacitated for years, for decades, and often lifetimes once you get entangled in it. I know that, and I stand here, because my life has been deeply impacted by the carceral system. And I stand here on the shoulders of many leaders, organizers, and coalition builders who came before and carried that baton forward as representative uh, Frazier is doing today, 
fighting for our relatives and fighting to restore the vote. So amidst the backdrop of a staggering rise also in the U.S. prison population that has grown nearly 500% in the last 50 years, um, we also know that these punitive changes in sentencing laws and policies have changed not because crime rates, increasingly punitive changes in sentencing laws and policies, not because of changes in crime rates explain most of this increase. I could go on and on and read you statistics and data um, of the disproportionate impact of people of color, um, but I'm not going to do that. And it's not because I'm not scientific or mathematic, it's because my people also include the heart uh, in our science and our math. Suffice it to say that the criminal justice system shouldn't have a say nor box us out of our democracy. I'm here because we are the descendants of these people who were stolen from their homes and from their families, from our cultures, our traditions, and languages that could wipe out our memories. And like many people in this room and many Minnesotans across our state, we've survived forcible removal, genocide, and disenfranchising policies. But throughout this, our people have fought for, helped steward, and shaped this country. Those people are like my Mexicana grandparents who worked as migrant workers, electricians, and mechanics, and like my Ojibwe mother who raised four kids on her own, working in a pizza factory and as a babysitter, who battled addictions and gender-based violence and homelessness, facing this colonial created poverty that was criminalized. The only elections or democratic process that my mother ever participated in her lifetime was in fact the tribal elections, um, where she actually saw herself reflected and was invited and ensured access to. And today, as we're talking about restoring the vote, I especially want to talk about my brothers, in particular, my big brother, Daniel. My brother, who at the age of 14 lost his dad, uh, who was taken too soon from HIV AIDS. Fast forward for my brother, who is incredible, the most funny person that I know in my life, brilliant, has faced injustice and barrier in boxes of trauma as a Native person moving through this world. My brother has winded up in and out of treatment and addictions with mental health challenges, and yes, he did land in prison. And I called my brother today, um, and I asked him and told him what it is that we're doing because my family are people who have never been in these spaces. They're people who have never voted, who have never registered to vote, who have never even participated in local or statewide and national democracy. And I told him what it is we're doing, and I asked him, what would it mean to you for us to restore your vote? And he said, I'm not a bad person. Being able to vote would mean that I could have a say in my kids' future and get it right for them, because it wasn't right for me. And what I want to say today is that people like my brother who have been incarcerated and people like my family who have been deeply impacted by the carceral system face consequence after consequence after consequence. My family, and as you see in your communities, face every barrier to secure housing because of their felony record. Face every barrier to be able to find a job that they can go to a second chance employer face every single barrier to healthcare and beyond. And so yes, my brother is paying his debt. But the thing is that I also ask you, stop scaring people. As a survivor of both violence in all of its forms and someone who has endured years and years of fighting uh, for justice and healing for myself, from this violence in the court system, do not speak for survivors. And I say as a survivor, restore the vote. And I also want to say that while my family member comes from decades and generations of people who have faced disenfranchisement, that we're born survivors and we were born victors, 
We are funny as heck and we laugh really hard. Like today when I was talking with my brother and laughing and looking back at his experience and how he ended up in prison. And my mom was in and out of jail, in and out of treatment centers, but she was an entrepreneur at heart. In jail, she scraped on the, the bedpost, the black paint to make eyeshadow for herself and her friends. We're people who never, ever give up. And voting is one way that we can build our power and how we can keep going one foot in front of the other and build that future, especially for our kids. So people like my brother, by restoring this vote, means that they get to have a say in their kids' education, that they get to have a say in their kids' housing, where their kids will be able to get health care and what kind of jobs that will lift them out of generational poverty to have possibilities for a better life. And when I was growing up, I did not appreciate being raised by my, my grandmother, who herself had been in and out of jail for her DWIs and others. But she was able to overcome these systems of oppression and disenfranchisement. And she knocked every door, and she was at every phone banking opportunity. And she rallied our community, and she brought our youth along because just in her lifetime, herself and her mother couldn't even vote. And so while I did not appreciate that as a kid, standing here with a microphone in front of all of you, having to listen to me carry on because I'm Ojibwe and I talk a lot, <laughs> um, it's because of what my family and what our communities have gone through to make sure that we can vote that if we dare have the audacity to dream even bigger and become an elected official, well, we can do that. That we are gonna reclaim our rightful place as leaders, as decision makers. But for people like my brother, success is gonna look different, but he won't be successful unless we have his back, unless people who have been put up against a corner and boxed out of our communities and left behind prison bars, know that we are there when they get out and that we're gonna restore their vote to have a say in their future. And so today, I ask you to hold this opportunity but see the responsibility that we have to the folks that our systems leave behind, exclude and box out. And so please vote green today and make inclusive voting rights history together. That's what I got, thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nadu. Am I saying that right? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, this is, this is a good idea. And I think it's the right idea. I don't think it's a great bill. I think it gets the job done. It does it, it, does it super clumsy. Um, it lacks that balance that I think that we're supposed to find in this body. Um, it restores a civil right to an offender, any offender, but it fails to recognize victims. And I'm not gonna argue you know, whether that's good or bad or in between here. Um, I do want to point out something that th the worst thing about this bill, in, in my mind, is it's built on the idea that one person, one party, one community, one ideology is the way that we do business. Um, I don't think one person, one party, one community, organization is always right. Um, we could have made this bill a lot better we could have found that balance between offenders and victims. We could have made sure that restitution was paid. We could have distinguished between homicides and, and property crimes. We could have answered questions that Corrections is gonna have as we move forward on this bill about intensive supervised release. We could have identified how probation is treated differently across this state how in rural Minnesota, it's, it's far, you have far longer probationary sentences than we do in, 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 in the metro. Um, we've heard tonight how hard it is to go to prison for a crime. Um, 
We could have done all those things. And honestly, I don't know if anybody's listening, but I truly do hope that this is the last bill that ignores the people that we represent. We're not here to poke people in the eye, at least I'm not. Um, you know, we're here to try to, try to contribute to the process. Um, we want to be a part of making these bills work for everyone. There's 2.7 million people that this side of the aisle represents. We want to be able to represent them in a, in a, in a way that, that, uh, that might be different than what you think. But disregarding our ideas so that we don't have to argue them, I think is disrespectful and it's unfortunate. Representative Frazier, I appreciate you, br you bringing this bill forward. Um, we have to start somewhere. I'm going to vote for your bill because I think it's a good start. Um, and I hope that we can continue to work on these things that will bring us closer together. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I also want to just acknowledge the moving words from Representative Kozlowski. Um, this issue has always made a lot of sense to me. Uh, once someone has been released from incarceration, the goal is to have them be re reintegrated as productive members of society. And voting is a key part of that. And voter rights restoration makes it less likely that people reoffend, and it strengthens communities and our democracy. I'm going to tell a little story about uh, really the most meaningful experience I had during my election campaign, which made this issue much more real and personal. Uh, one afternoon, I spent several hours door knocking at apartment buildings owned by Perspectives, a St. Louis Park nonprofit. Perspectives is a phenomenal human service program that aims to return single mothers and their children emerging from homelessness and addiction back to the economic and social mainstream. It does an incredible job addressing some of society's most pressing issues, equity, homelessness, poverty, addiction, mental illness, food security, and lack of, access, lack of access to opportunity. The mothers I met while door knocking were so inspiring. They're working hard to improve their lives and the lives of their kids in unimaginable circumstances. Some of them were previously incarcerated. I had so many amazing conversations that day, but there is one person in particular that really stands out in the context of this bill. Krista is a single mom of four. She has a felony for a stolen vehicle and is now on probation. She's been sober for three years and just received a real estate license. What I especially remember about Krista is her excellent, thoughtful, and quite pointed questions. She grilled me. And then, even after that initial conversation, a short time later, I'm on the lawn walking to one of the other apartment buildings, and she came out and found me to ask more, and in fact, to talk to me about this issue, to make sure I really understood it, because she wants to participate in our democracy. So Krista should be able to vote now. The other women I met at Perspectives that are not able to vote should also be able to. I'm proud to be supporting this bill and urge everyone to vote green. The member from Wasika, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and um, I'm wondering if the author, uh, Representative Frazier, would yield for a question or two? He will yield. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Frazier, um, can you tell us the reason why voting rights, because that's the only thing that this bill is dealing with, so let's only talk about that right. Can you tell us the reason why voting rights are taken away from those that are, are convicted of a felony and incarcerated? Representative Frazier. Representative Petersburg. In my opening comments, I talked about the history of disenfranchisement. Unfortunately, because of the uh, egregious past that this country has in terms of how it's treated certain individuals, stealing the land from indigenous folks, bringing over and enslaving people from Africa, preventing them from having access to all things within this country, 
That is the history of disenfranchisement. That is the history of this law. Facts. Facts. That is why folks don't have the right to vote when they are convicted of felonies. Representative Petersburg. Thank you. And if he'd be willing to yield for another question or two. He will. Representative Petersburg. If that's the case, then why does this bill stop at giving rights to only those that are no longer incarceration? Why shouldn't the bill have been given rights to everybody, including those that are incarcerated, if this is your premise? Representative Frazier. Representative Petersburg, are you offering an oral amendment to do that right now? <laughs> Representative Petersburg. Uh, no, I'd just like the answer. Representative Frazier. Like Representative Nadeau said, this is a good start. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. So I, I guess we can figure out what's coming next. Um, if he could answer uh, just one more question. Um, if you yield. He will yield. Representative so, Petersburg. So this bill is probably the first step in, in what you want to do. But, but in it, it talks about just those that were on probation and are no longer in um, custody or in incarceration. If the individual breaks and or violates the terms of their probation, what is the consequences for that? Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Petersburg, if the individual uh, violates the terms of their probation or their probate uh, or parole or community supervision and they are returned back into the incarceral state, they lose their right to vote while they're in incarceral state. Representative Petersburg. Uh, th thank you. And, and I think that kind of goes to the point that, that when they're no longer incarceration but still on probation, they really aren't finished with their uh, terms of their uh, conviction. I, I just want to say we've heard earlier that if they have served their time, then they deserve to um, have these rights taken back. And unless I'm mistaken, that is actually the current law. If you've served your time and you're no longer on probation or there, you, you do get those rights back. And I want us to remind us that when you are given parole, usually it's because you have not served, or a probation, I should say that, because you have not finished your term, but are given that probation in lieu of the remaining time on, uh, of the sentence. Otherwise, if you violate the probation, there wouldn't be any other incarceration to do that. And so in reality, what we're saying is that Individuals are given, uh, because of various other various reasons, they are given probation in lieu of the time that they still have to serve. So they still have time to serve if, if they so choose, and this is an opportunity for them to have some additional freedoms and other things in lieu of that, of that service. And I think we heard earlier about how um, we need to give incentives for people to really be involved and engaged. And I might argue that if we really wanted to help people, maybe we ought to increase the expectation and accountabilities on each of us and on each other rather than letting everything slide. To me, I think that's a situation where society actually starts deteriorating itself. But in either case, uh, this particular bill actually, I think, uh, rewards those that have not finished serving their time. Uh, just because they're not incarcerated doesn't mean they, haven't they're, they don't have time yet to serve. They still underneath supervision of the government and of the correction uh, program. So I would highly urge us to vote no. Uh, this is um, the, the wrong time, the wrong place till we get the rest of it corrected. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Freiburg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This was the first bill we heard in the Elections Committee, and I was proud to support it there, and I'll be proud to support it again tonight. It's been around for many years. Um, it's great to see my classmate and predecessor as Elections Committee Chair, former Representative Ray Dean here. He championed th this bill tirelessly, drawing on his compelling personal story. And stories are so important to this bill. I hope you listened to Representative Kozlowski's story of their brother. It was a powerful example of how this bill will make a transformational change in people's lives. I don't know that I have as compelling of a personal story, but I can cite some statistics. House File 28 would follow the clear trend in other states. Um, in the last three years, Nevada, Colorado, New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, and Washington restored voting rights to citizens on parole. 
In total, 21 states automatically restore voting rights after incarceration ends, including red states like North Dakota and blue states like Illinois. Thank you to my Senate District colleague, uh, Representative Fraser, for pointing out the inequities that our current system leads to. Restoring voter rights is an equity issue and a racial justice issue. Black Minnesotans account for 20% of those ineligible to vote, but make up just 4% of the state's voting age population. Indigenous Minnesotans are less than 1% of the voting age population, but are almost 7% of those ineligible to vote. Hispanic Minnesotans are 2.5% of the voting age population, but 6% of those with voting rights withheld. The vast majority of people who commit serious crimes will re-enter society. They will be out in the community. They will hopefully be working and paying taxes. They should have a say in who governs them. When people have their voting rights restored, they are more engaged in their community and they are less likely to reoffend. Voting is a cornerstone of a healthy democracy and it, sure, and, it, it, and it ensures that citizens have a voice in decisions that impact their lives. I hope many members will exercise their vote in this chamber tonight by voting green. Thank you. The member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this is an emotional issue, I understand. Um, and there's been a lot of heated rhetoric in this debate. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that Minnesotans might misunderstand a little bit about where the differences are uh, between the members of, of this debate. So I want to start by focusing on, a, on three things that I believe we all agree on. I think if we, if we had a vote on these three principles, it would be a uh, unanimous vote on all three of them. The first is... Uh, I believe, I hope, we all agree that the right to vote is a fundamental right, that our elections are absolutely essential to our democracy, that are the only way that the people can hold us accountable, um, and it is absolutely a sacred and fundamental right. Second, I believe we all agree, I hope we all agree, that crimes against society have levels of accountability and necessary just levels of accountability that require, in cir certain circumstances, losing certain rights. That's why we incarcerate people. So they lose their freedom because of certain uh, things they have done that we as a society say are morally wrong. They're not just mistakes. Hopefully we are not criminalizing mistakes. If we are criminalizing mistakes, we're doing it wrong. There are morally wrong things, things that people do that harm society, that harm other people, that are violent to other people, that require, as a matter of justice, certain uh, just consequences. Sometimes that includes losing other freedoms as well as the freedom of free movement by being incarcerated. Sometimes you lose your right to bear, keep and bear arms protected by the Second Amendment. Sometimes you lose your right to be a member of a jury, as uh, Representative Petersburg mentioned. And sometimes, yes, you lose your right to vote. Third, I believe we all agree, I certainly agree, I believe everyone on this side of the aisle agrees, that second chances are important, that rehabilitation is important, and that rehabilitation is a beautiful thing. It is absolutely core to who we are as human beings and core to our criminal justice system, that we create opportunities for those who have done something wrong to find some way to be restored for it. And I believe that is an important goal in our criminal justice system. So we've heard a lot about when your debt has been paid, when the price has been paid, then you should get your rights back. If we, if we wanted to vote on that, principle, that would be a unanimous vote. Where this body disagrees is what it means to have paid your debt back to society. What is the price that has to be paid? And the fact of the matter is, the way Minnesota's criminal justice system is set up right now, there is no way to understand a lot of criminal sentences without considering probation or supervised release to be an essential part of the price that we are asking that person to pay for the, for the morally wrong thing that they have done to society. Now, there, there is a real problem with some of the ways in, that Minnesota has historically de dealt with 
supervised release. And I talked to Representative Frazier um, about this in the Judiciary Committee, and that is a real thing that we should solve, not, not just in the context of voting, but in the context of unjust situations where some people have paid what I think we would all agree has been their debt to society, but they are still being limited, uh, still being required to uh, engage in supervision in, relation, uh, uh, in, their, in their release. But this bill really very much draws the line in the wrong, in the wrong place, and I think it uh, reflects a blind spot about the nature and the just consequences of crime. Some examples that we've seen and heard in the debate tonight. Felony voting violations. Felony voting violations, at least as the way we're talking about it here, we're saying those have no price. Those, are almost, those have always been given in, Minnesota, in the recent Minnesota history, supervised release and not incarceration. If that's paying the price, if only incarceration is paying the price, then we are saying that there is no price. There are many other serious crimes which only receive probation and supervised release. We're regarding those as having no crime. Someone just uh, a few days ago received three years supervised release for the crime of committing arson at the Brooklyn Park Salvation Army. The way we're talking about price by passing this bill, there's no price to be paid for that uh, crime. And we're saying, we said by voting down an amendment here, that restitution for victims is not part of the price that we as a society believe has to be paid for a crime. So I absolutely agree that we should be looking at the injustices that are perpetuated on some people because in the past, especially, Minnesota has had some overly long supervised release or pro, uh, uh, probation periods of time. We should absolutely look at that. We should absolutely figure out how to restore those people's not only voting rights, but their rights to keep and bear arms, and their rights to, be, to serve on a jury and to be full members of society, and to not have to continue to report to a probation officer 20, 30 years after they've, uh, uh, after they've been released from incarceration. That is the place we should stop, but we must not water down the price that needs to be paid for serious crimes. This is a very dangerous approach that this bill is taking. It's a reckless road, um, especially in a time of, uh, of uh, increasing violent crime in the state of Minnesota, that we are making a statement that many, many crimes in Minnesota do not have a price that needs to be paid. Um, and so for that reason, members, I urge you to vote no. Member from Olmsted, Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Voting is a right of citizenship. It's the fundamental mechanism by which we, the government, receive the consent of the governed. It's an important idea. It's a critical idea. In fact, I would go further and say it's a marvel of the modern world that citizens hold the power over their governments. The vast majority of humanity has not enjoyed that right. We are living in a wonderful time. But over the past couple of centuries, our little American experiment have tried again and again to disenfranchise people. And we have learned again and again and again that this leads to injustice, that it leads to abuse, and it stands against the foundations of what we are trying to do as a nation, and I will say also as a state of Minnesota. In fact, I think most of, most of us in here would agree it's not just a right, voting is an obligation. It's a duty that we place to this state, to our societies, to our communities. And no matter what your race is, your area code, what your income is, that is something that you should have a right to have. A say in your country and in your community. Tonight, I've heard variations on the sentence, those people don't deserve to vote. I feel gross just saying that sentence, but that sentiment has been alive and well in here this evening. These people shouldn't vote. The underlying premise of that question is that we have the power to say that person votes, that person doesn't. Imagine that. That is what we are saying this legislator has the legislation has the power to do. Now, we heard during one of the amendments a lot of talk of the social contract, so I want to quote another uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, quote, those who think themselves the masters of others are indeed greater slaves than they. There's been a lot of talk 
feeling that we are masters of other people, that we can say when they can vote and when they cannot. I want to be clear that I support this amendment. I think Representative Frazier has done a fantastic job this evening in bringing this through committee, but I don't think it goes far enough. Representative Petersburg, I think you were right. Great point. I think all those citizens should have the right to vote. Voting is not a cudgel to punish, but it's a fundamental human right in our representative democracy. Right now in Minnesota, there are 8,152 souls incarcerated around Minnesota. Each of them have dreams, they have goals, they work, they create art, they watch TV, they have friends, they have family, they pay taxes, and they have no voice in this democracy. No voice, and in fact, potentially no group needs a voice more than prisoners. Because of the unfortunate wording of our 13th Amendment in the U.S. Constitution, they are the only group that is currently able to be enslaved legally. They are not paid a living wage. According to recent studies, they can be paid anywhere between 25 cents and $2 an hour for their labor that all of us enjoy. And on top of that, I don't know if you've visited a prison complex recently, most prisoners have to pay for things like toilet paper and soap out of those lousy wages that probably most of them want to either send back to their families or save up so they can be members of society when they re-enter our society. You also might not know that prisoners are still counted in our census. So the power of their bodies is represented here, but not their voice. We might call that a modern three-fifths compromise that we are happily living with right now in this state and in this country. And I, I've heard tonight a lot of you are very nervous about public safety, and that's great. I have good news for you. Giving voting to those who are incarcerated actually helps public safety. People feel connected to their communities. They continue that tie. So when they get back out into society, they don't reoffend. They feel the closeness of being in society. They are not, and this is a technical term we use for this, civically deceased. They are real people that we recognize. Furthermore, granting suffrage to incarcerated individuals will not lead to any sort of rise of crime or bad laws. Uh, two states in our union, Maine and Vermont, have never in the history of their state taken away voting rights for inmates. There's not been a rise in killing. There hasn't been, uh, I, don't, I don't know, people don't commit more crimes because they're like, oh, we're going to keep our voting. They still keep the law. And on that score, tonight there's been several discussions as if the law doesn't exist. The law does exist, folks. There's penalties when you break the law. People are not not committing theft because they're nervous about their voting rights getting taken away. There's real penalties. And we're all politicians here, so I know many of you might be thinking this is politically unfeasible. So I'm just going to uh, throw out here, and I'm glad to send this information to whoever who wants it. A national poll was conducted by the Sentencing Project, and 56% of likely voters say that they would want to uh, restore voting rights for persons outside of prison and inside of prison. Universal suffrage is a democratic virtue, lowercase d, democratic virtue, that Minnesota should adopt. And I do hope is coming, Representative. And I want to close with a little thought exercise here that applies to this bill, but also hopefully to a bill that will come in the future. I want us to reflect on our country's sad history of disenfranchisement and ask yourself, which, if any, do you think was a good idea? Do you think it was a good idea for the Founding Fathers to give non-land uh, owning individuals or to not give them the right to vote? Do you think it was a good idea for black Americans, indigenous peoples, other ethnic and racial minorities, and religious minorities not to be able to vote? Was that a good idea? Was it right to ask 18 and 21 year olds to go to Vietnam, risk their life for this country, and not have a voice in its political system? Was it right to deny the vote to half of humanity, all those with the gender identity of woman cannot vote? I think all of us, these are rhetorical questions, because all of us in here would say these are embarrassing moments in our history, in this country, in this state's history. 
and we're glad that they have been corrected. But let us not move past the point that at all of those points in history, lawmakers, some in this very chamber, thought that all of those things were justified. They thought those people can't vote. And they thought they had justification for it. And we look back on that and we recognize that those legislators were wrong. And it was a grievous error as we've heard from many stories. And people had to organize and fight and bleed and die to restore those rights. So tonight I- Madam Speaker, point of order. Point of State your point of order. P point of inquiry. Did, did the, the member just suggest that there are members of this body right here who support slavery? No, Representative New Brindley, he was referring to history. Literally Representative said people in this chamber, and I would ask that, Madam Speaker that on a you point of order. You are out of order. It is inappropriate order. to interrupt a person's Madam speech Speaker, because you order. don't like what they're saying. Representative New Brindley. Point of order, I would, I would encourage the body to remember uh, to not bring personalities and motives into debate. Representative Smith, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I was considering history. It's a very good thing to consider history. And I'm, I'm almost done here, so I'm just gonna say, I want you guys to think about those moments in history when people were justified in wanting to take the vote from other people. They were wrong. You don't wanna be wrong on this. Voting is a key part of who we are. I'm done, thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, appreciate the uh, debate on the floor today. Um, obviously, there's a difference of opinion here, uh, but I'll tell you where there is no difference of opinion. I think everybody in this chamber, I know at least the people on my side of the aisle, absolutely want felons to have the right to vote when they have paid their debt to society. I think we all want felons to have the right to vote, but I probably couldn't say it better than Representative Niska did earlier. The question here is, when have they paid their debt to society? Do we do it differently than they do in other states? Maybe we do. I want every uh, uh, person who has been convicted of a felony and, and uh, either incarcerated or, or placed on probation to have the opportunity at a second chance, to have the opportunity to uh, you know, repent and, and, and uh, receive forgiveness. And, and I, I think that you know, every one of them should gain the right to vote back. But what this bill fails to do is have any sort of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, um, kind of ability to, to decipher between somebody who has made the decision that what they did was wrong and commit to a life of not doing that again and somebody who thinks, boy, did I skate by I didn't get put in jail. I'm just on, uh, on, on probation now. But in their heart, they still feel the same and they'll continue to commit crimes. We all know that the rate of recidivism uh, is high uh, amongst folks that have been convicted of, of, of crimes. And I, and I do understand, and I, I'm actually gonna question your motives that I think you're gonna agree with me. I think your heart's in the right place. I think you wanna see the good in those people. So I, th I think you want to believe that those people are, are good at heart and aren't going to commit those crimes again. I think that's honorable, but I don't think we get to make that decision. We have a justice system that decides that, and we have uh, probation officers that work with those people uh, who get to make those decisions and recommendations to the court on shortening those kinds of sentences. Um, I, I think it's interesting. You know, for me, that's always been the question. I, I have sympathy to, to seeing that these people uh, get to have all of their rights restored and, and return to a life enjoying all of the rights of a citizen of this country. Um, so I have sympathy to what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, Representative Hollins at the, at the very beginning, I think she was the first person to speak um, after third reading said um, she was excited, or not excited, I'm adding that, 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 that this bill would, would give uh, these people, their rights fully restored, their rights fully restored, that's the part that I wrote down. Um, this doesn't fully restore their rights. It picks and chooses. It, it picks and chooses the right that you want to restore. Um, these people aren't gonna have their right to serve on a, a jury restored. They're not gonna have their right to a firearm restored. 
It's just that you want them to have the right to vote. And in an, in an effort to, to have a little common sense in this and to have some little judgment of maybe some crimes are different than others, and maybe somebody who's been convicted of felony voter fraud shouldn't have the right to vote. We offered amendments that would restrict that. But the reality is, under this bill, someone who's convicted of felony voter fraud, who isn't incarcerated, who might only get probation, will never lose their right to vote. That's bonkers. But it's true, in this bill, if somebody is not incarcerated, they will not lose their right to vote. And they may have been convicted of felony voter fraud. So this bill doesn't have any ability to decipher who's good at heart and who's not, or which crime might this be applicable to and which crime might it not. Folks on that side of the aisle aren't determining that someone should have all of their rights restored when they've paid their debt to society. What they're deciding today is that someone should have the rights that they want restored when they think it's appropriate before someone has paid their debt to society. If you want to change the system, change the system. This bill skirts the system. And that's why I can't support it. The member from Hennepin, Representative Greenman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am really proud to rise in support of this bill. It is long overdue. You could say decades, and I know that there are folks in the gallery who've been working on this for years and decades, or potentially centuries. And I'm really proud that we're passing this with the urgency that it deserves. Rightly, the first act of responding to Minnesota voters and the mandate that they gave us to fight for an inclusive multiracial democracy. It is a key step in this work, and I want to thank Representative, Fra Fra Representative Frazier for the work he's done, uh, Representative Dean, who carried this, Repre former Representative Ellison, Rep Senator Bobby Joe Champion, and so many others who've really carried this with a coalition of folks uh, um, who have really uh, uh, worked hard. Our democracy works best when all voices are included. It's about harnessing the power of Minnesotans to come together, to govern, to solve problems, to make decisions, and build a collective future that's inclusive, and that includes all of us. Our democracy has not been perfect, far from it. Historical exclusions and current structural barriers cause disparities and, and oppressions in participation, representation, the representation of BIPOC communities, of young folks, of new Americans, of folks with disabilities, and other marginalized communities, and that has undermined the full promise of inclusive democracy. So has the dark and racist history of felony disenfranchisement laws that continue to undermine the full promise of democracy. But the promise of American democracy is that we together have the power to improve it, that we together can strengthen it and can build together across our differences, race, generation, region, and gender. And that's what we're doing here today. Minnesota's policy of felony disenfranchisement has deprived us of the voices and perspectives of 60,000 Minnesotans. Minnesotans like Representative Kuzlowski's big brother, Daniel, who should be at the center, their experience is at the center of helping us make better policies and our government more responsive. This bill restores the right to vote for those Minnesotans living, working, raising kids in our community, those 60,000 voices that have been missing from our policy process. And we heard Representative Kwam, Representative Niska, talk about the need to actually reform and create a more just system. Those folks need to be part of that conversation. We need those votes in that policy conversation. But the impact of this goes far beyond those 60,000 Minnesotans. And I want to tell a story about one of those people. When I was a young lawyer in private practice, I used to help Minnesotans get their records expunged for nonviolent offenses. I worked with folks trying to help them get, uh, um, deal with the collateral consequences of their criminal um, convictions. And I had, a, I had a client named Benita. She'd gotten one felony for bad check two decades earlier. 
She was working really hard. She was in job training. She was doing everything right and trapped in a cycle of poverty, temporary jobs because she'd have a job for three months and then she'd have the application for the permanent job and her felony conviction would keep her from getting it. Slum lord, trapped with slum lords and in slum housing because that was the only uh, application she'd get approved for rent. She was working hard to get her, turn her life around and we were working together to help her deal with those, uh, those uh, collateral consequences. And on one of our calls after talking about, I think we were preparing for an upcoming expungement hearing, she said to me, it's getting to be voting time and I wanna talk to you about whether I'm eligible to vote. It broke my heart. It was 2012. She'd been off papers, off probation and parole since 1995 and had been eligible to vote for 17 years. But she'd been told felons can't vote in a very scary way. She was confused of the law and afraid of the consequences of voting. But this time she happened to have a lawyer, she happened to have someone she could ask, and she did. And she was so happy to hear that she was eligible to vote. She talked, we talked through getting registered, we talked through the mechanics of voting. She left excited about the election and exercising her right to vote. But all I could think about was how many elections she'd missed that she'd been eligible to vote in. Five presidential elections she'd missed because of this confusing and unjust disenfranchised law. Ten congressional elections, countless state and local elections that she actually wanted to participate in and was eligible to vote in. So today, this bill establishes a fair, bright line. If you're a citizen living in our community, if you're raising your kids, if you can show up at that polling place, you can vote. It restores the right for those tens of thousands of Minnesotans and fully recognizes the franchise of hundreds of thousands more. This is a good bill. It's a good bill for those women and men who've served their time and it's a good bill for our democracy. I'm very proud to vote for this bill. I'm very proud to stand with the folks who have been working so hard to end this injustice and I'd ask you to stand with them and vote yes. Thank you. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I wanna talk about some things that have been said tonight. We've, we've heard phrases like um, folks who are returning to society, um, people who have served their time. Uh, we've heard the phrase, when they are released. We've heard lots of these phrases, but here's the problem. In the state of Minnesota, many of these people never serve time. They're not incarcerated. In fact, Representative Robbins gave us strong statistics from just the last few years. In 2019, 40%, 40% of those who were convicted of crimes where there would be a presumptive prison sentence, meaning the legislature and the State Sentencing Guidelines Commission have determined that these people should be incarcerated. 40% of those people were never incarcerated. 28% of people convicted of criminal sexual conduct were never incarcerated. So we've got some competing ideologies here. Because on the one hand, we're being told that these folks have served their time. That they, uh, that now that they have fulfilled their punishments, they should be allowed to vote. But here's the problem. They haven't served any time. Their punishment is probation. That is their punishment. We, um, oh, we, we've heard things like there's a staggering rise in prison population in the US. Well, not in Minnesota. In Minnesota, 
our incarceration rate is about half the national average. And that's according to the National Institute of Corrections. Like, these are not my statistics. I'm not making this up. I'm not pulling this out of thin air. The National Institute of Corrections shows that Minnesota incarcerates people at half the rate, not half the population, half the rate of the national average. In the state of Minnesota, we choose to use probation as a punishment instead of incarceration. And I would think that the majority party would think that that's a good thing. Because they're, not, they're certainly not trying to change that. So when we talk about the staggering rise in prison population in the US, it's a red herring. Does not apply here in Minnesota. And I'm not real sure that it applies anywhere. Um, We've heard the phrase that these are folks who are doing everything right. They're doing everything right. Well, clearly not. They have been convicted of a felony. They didn't trip and fall into a felony. They were convicted of their own behavior committing a felony. But frankly, if they're doing everything right, then I'm not sure why we don't apply this across the board. These, these convicted felons, they're doing everything right. So why are we doing background checks? Are we, are we holding these folks to that standard? That they should still have background checks? That they should still be disqualified from maybe working in a childcare center? A school, a nursing home? Or should we just abandon that too? Because, hey, they're doing everything right. But I don't believe that's what you mean. I don't believe that that's what you think here. Um, we've also been told that this is the most powerful tool in democracy. And I agree with that. Voting is a sacred right in this country. Yet when we had an opportunity to protect democracy earlier tonight, we chose not to do that. We chose not to do that. You know, I want to point out that this bill is the very first bill the Democrats have brought to the floor regarding crime this year. This is the very first bill that the Democrats have bought, brought to the floor having anything to do with crime. They did not bring forward some accountability for prosecutors who are giving these downward departures and not in recommending people be incarcerated as the guidelines suggest. They didn't bring forward a bill for transparency in the judicial system so that the public can know why people are not being incarcerated when they should. They didn't bring forward a bill regarding the violent carjackings we're seeing rampant in the state of Minnesota. That certainly is increasing at an alarming rate. While our prison populations are not growing at an alarming rate, violent carjackings are growing at an alarming rate in Minnesota. But we didn't bring forward a bill on that. Instead, the very first bill having anything to do with crime to be brought to the House floor this year is restoring voting rights in a state that incarcerates people at half the rate of the national average. This is the priority for the Democrat Party having anything to do with crime in the state of Minnesota. We're bringing forward a bill to restore voting rights for violent offenders who have not discharged their sentences. This is a bill restoring voting rights for, for, for felons convicted of violating election laws and committing voting 
crimes. You know, we've been told that a lot of the things that, that we are bringing up are extreme, egregious. We're bringing up these crazy examples. And you know what? I kind of agree. They are crazy. They are egregious. They are extreme. Like the man, the 20-year-old man who just Monday, a few days ago, 20-year-old man in the Rochester area was convicted of raping a four-year-old and a nine-year-old. Raping a four-year-old and a nine-year-old. He was given a sentence of 180 days. But guess what? He already served that in jail, so he's not going back. Right now, he was, he was convicted on Monday, and he is not in prison for raping a four-year-old and a nine-year-old. So you're right. I do think that's extreme. I do think that's egregious. And I do think it is reasonable that we restrict his rights. I think it is reasonable that we say that you have committed crimes against people that are frankly unforgivable. And it's reasonable to say that maybe you should lose some voting rights for a while. And in fact, in his case, he's got probation for 30 years. He's not going to spend a day in prison. 30 years probation. But let's not restrict his rights. Let's not restrict his rights. How about that four-year-old and that nine-year-old? But heaven forbid we restrict his rights. We have a theme in this chamber right now. Just close your eyes and plow through. Good policy be damned. This is where we are. This is where we are. We don't care about good policy. We care more about the rights of those convicted of crimes. By the way, this convicted felon who was convicted on Monday, who will not spend another day in jail, let alone prison, will now be eligible to vote in the next election. Call me crazy, but I am perfectly comfortable with him not voting. I am perfectly comfortable. But again, we're going to plow through. We're going to close our eyes. We are going to ignore good policy. We are going to ignore input from anyone who might disagree with us in any way, even if it's a good idea. And frankly, we offered a lot of good ideas to, tonight. And you know that that's the case because the majority party wouldn't vote on them. If they don't think it's a good idea, they just vote no. That's how that works. But when it's a good idea, they have to do things like amend the amendments so they don't actually mean anything, or call them not germane so that we don't have to take a vote, or call them out of order so we don't have to take a vote. That's what happens when we bring forward good ideas. Because if they were bad ideas, you would just take a vote and you would just vote no. But that's not what happened. And apparently, this is what democracy looks like. The member from Hennepin, Representative Long, who's going out of the customary order, which would be the majority leader would indicate to you that we're very close to the end of the list, but we aren't. Representative Long. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There is a reason I'm trying to go now, so I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, we have had colleagues on the other side of the aisle point out that we are a low incarceration state. Uh, and in the context of the United States, they're correct. But Minnesota is a national outlier on probation. We have been the number five or number six state in the country for probation length for years. And when you 
combine the probation and time and incarceration, that means we're number 13th under supervision. So we are not a low punishment state. The average probation term in Minnesota, in fact, is longer than the average prison term. Until recent action by the Walls administration to correct this, there were probation terms being handed out for 20, 30, or more years. The lead plaintiff in the lawsuit against the state on voting rights restoration is Jennifer Schroeder. Jennifer and I met working on probation reform together several years ago. When she was struggling with chemical dependency, Jennifer received a sentence of one year in prison for a nonviolent drug possession charge, but a 40-year probation term. 40 years. She has gone on to graduate from college with a 4.0 GPA and has focused on drug and addiction counseling. She managed the sober living house that helped her when she got out of prison. But because of her excessive and outrageous probation term, she won't be able to vote until October 2053, when she is 71 years old. Jennifer is here in the chamber today. And I just want to take a minute to thank Jennifer for sharing her personal story and for lending her voice to this movement, to this cause, and being willing to be out front with your story so that we can make the changes that are necessary to our laws. The reason I asked to go a little earlier is that Jennifer has an almost two-year-old who she's going to have to get back to pretty soon. So thank you for the indulgence. There are also unconscionable racial disparities and who is caught up in the criminal justice system, from who is arrested, to who is charged, to who is incarcerated. And these disparities carry forward as well to who is barred from voting. About 4.5% of voting age black Minnesotans and 8.3% of American Indian Minnesotans are disenfranchised due to voting restrictions compared to less than 1% of white Minnesotans. We know that prohibiting Minnesotans from voting when on probation had a racist past, as Representative Frazier has alluded to. State felony bans took off during the 1860s and 1870s following the passage of the 15th Amendment, which was intended to guarantee black Americans the right to vote. And it has a racist present, too. It also has implications beyond the immediate people who are affected, the immediate people who are currently barred from voting, as Representative Greenman spoke eloquently to. I've spoken to many individuals who thought they were barred from voting when they actually could. So this is disenfranchising many, many more than who are simply those who are currently on probation. The fairness of restoring voting rights upon release from incarceration is widely recognized and in effect in 21 states, including red states like North Dakota. These states don't pick and choose. North Dakota doesn't distinguish by crime. North Dakota says if you're out, you can vote. Criminal justice issues are very easy to caricature. They are very easy to fan the flames of fear. But this bill has nothing to do with safety. This bill is about redemption. This is about fairness for 55,000 Minnesotans. This is correcting a wrong with racist origins. Uh, and I, I see that he's left at the floor, but I wanted to thank uh, Representative Nadeau. And I hope that others will join you. This is not partisan. When Representative Dean, who was here earlier, carried this bill, before elections were as partisan as they seem to have become in recent years, Representative Zerwas was the number two author. Representative Hamilton was an author on the bill. Representative Garofalo was an author on the bill. Representative Baker was an author on the bill. Rep now Senator Barr was an author on the bill. This is about doing what's right. And I hope that we will do that tonight, and I hope many across the aisle will join us in doing that. It's time for Minnesotans to restore this fundamental right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Sherburne, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Speaker Hortman. Um, I don't have the ability to keep standing up and repeating the same talking points and statistics that are slanted. So my speech that I promised in public safety to be over my eight minute rule has been substantially cut down. I can't do the hyperbole, but I will say one thing. Two days ago, Violence Free Minnesota had a memorial for the victims of intimate partner homicide. Most of you should have walked past those t-shirts downstairs outside of our caucus room.
Representative Frazier and the others keep bringing up the racial disparities of the people in custody. And not once, not once did I ever hear anyone bring up the racial disparities of the victims. I can sit and show the statistics that show if you're a Native American female, you have a seven times higher rate of dying. We have the statistics that, that follow the victimhood. Don't worry about the race of the perpetrator or the suspect. Honor the victims. There were over 100 murders in Minneapolis and St. Paul last year alone. Over 100. Every one of those persons had a family that's missing their loved ones. Remember them. Representative Long, you brought up the people that would have signed on to the bill. And you know what? Had we, we had amendments that would have cut out everyone but murderers and criminal sexual conduct. And you wouldn't take it. I'm telling you, I would have stood up here and I'd have, I'd have signed on and I'd have voted for this bill if we cut out the people that eliminate the victim's right to vote forever. Uh, I'm not, I, I guess I'm not much of a politician, as I said. I, I can't throw the, the hyperbole and, and the hyperbold. All I can tell you is this. If you can walk out of here and go downstairs one floor and look at those t-shirts and wonder, I wonder how they would have voted I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. We had an amendment that would have made sense. I would have stood right here and said, vote green. I wouldn't have necessarily agreed with it at all, but I'd have said, vote green. Because it's the right thing to do. I believe in redemption. I believe in the second chance. Those people don't get a second chance. What about them? Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, my eyes are open. Um, and I, uh, I did know that I'm at higher risk uh, to be a victim of a crime because I have been a victim of a crime. Um, and as we heard from Representative Kozlowski and we've heard in the past from other legislators, uh, we know that. We don't need to be told that. We, we already know because we live that life. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is, is this letter. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about victims and where are their voices in this. And somehow in the talking points and the rhetoric, we have um, diminished this letter that we all got on our desks. And this letter is a joint letter from uh, the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, uh, Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, Violence Free Minnesota, and the Minnesota Alliance on Crime. Collectively, these organizations represent over 100 programs statewide. And you know, I don't know if folks maybe just looked at the logos at the top and didn't actually read it, but I think it's really important that we do read it because um, they talk about this bill as a violence prevention strategy. So if you're wondering what people think, what the people on, you, the reason the t-shirts are downstairs is because Violence Free Minnesota does that every year to remind us about the voices and about uh, domestic violence victims. And so I think, read the letter. I think it's really important that we actually read the letter because these, this, these are the organizations that do the work. I mean, who are we as legislators who spend a lot of our time in these two buildings to think that we know better than the people who are on the ground hearing the stories, doing the work every single day? And so I, I want to lift that up because we've sort of, we've diminished these voices in this letter when we keep talking about victims and not talking about this letter because that is what these organizations do. This is their voice. Um, I also wanted to bring up, there was another piece of paper that we got uh, from the Minnesota Justice Research Center. And uh, although I, I represent Ramsey County now, um, I'm, I'm a rural Minnesota girl at heart. I grew up on the res. And a couple things that stood out to me, and I, I'm gonna speak for these folks because I don't, I haven't heard anyone else speak for them, but uh, the counties where the highest percentage of folks are disenfranchised right now from voting, Beltrami, 
Cass, Minoman, Malax. What do those counties have in common? I, I'm going to guess, I heard somebody say the word casinos. That's great, but it's actually our people who live there. We're more than casinos. And there's a couple other, so actually Minoman, 4.9% of the voting population in Minoman County is disenfranchised from voting because of our current laws. It's not Hennepin County, it's not Ramsey County, it's Monoman County, it's Kuchichin County. Those are the counties that are most impacted. Those rural voters are the ones who are disenfranchised right now um, with our current system. And I, I think it's important that we look at these numbers because total, there are over 40,000 people. A whole legislative district worth of people are disenfranchised from voting because of the way that we have things set up right now. And the systems that disenfranchise these voters, the, the blocks that built the system were intentionally put into place by elected officials who those folks didn't get to elect. So when we talk about history, we, that's what we're talking about. It was intentionally built this way to disenfranchise those voters. It's not a coincidence that those are the voters most impacted. It was done intentionally. That's why history matters. That's why all those other comments really matter because it wasn't an accident that indigenous folks, that black folks, that poor folks were more impacted by these laws. That was intentional so that they don't even get a say in who decides what the rules are and what the laws are that impact them. And so then it's on us right now as elected officials to right that wrong, to rebuild that system. And that's what we're doing. That's what this is about. This is a civil rights bill. Because the current system blocks those most impacted from having a voice in how we fix it. So that's what we're doing here today. And I, um, we've heard a lot of scary words, a lot of rhetoric and talking points, a lot of that stuff. But my eyes are open. And I'm actually here with joy. I, this is a bill I have wanted to vote on since the day I first came here when I was sworn in in 2017. I could not understand why we didn't get to vote on this bill. It didn't even get to move in committee, but we get to do that right now. We, get to, we have a chance to help re-enfranchise those 40,000 people in Minnesota. So I'm not standing here with, with, with fear. I am standing here with, with hope uh, because I don't think that folks are defined by the worst thing that they've ever done. I don't think that your life is over after the worst thing that you've ever done. Because I do believe in redemption and I do believe in hope. Hope, that might sound cheesy, but hope is the thing that gets people to make the changes to do better, to heal. So that's what I'm focused on right now. That is the hope that I bring to this. And I'm going to be pushing that green button with joy. And we all should be able to do that because this is a good thing that we're doing for people across our state. And I am really happy, uh, Vice Chair Frazier, uh, that we finally get, get to bring this to the floor. Thank you. The member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Thank you, uh, Speaker Hortman, and thank you, members, for a, a lively and long uh, debate on this bill. Uh, the truth is, at its heart, this is an elections bill, not a sentencing bill, not a criminal justice bill. There certainly are problems with Minnesota's system that actually allows us to give probation to someone for a period of 40 years. But that's not what the heart of this bill is about. The heart of this bill is about elections and the privilege that we in America have to vote in our elections. Many of us on this side of the aisle believe that when you commit a serious crime against our society, that that interrupts that right to vote, that you have done something so egregious that you don't deserve to vote, frankly, because you have demonstrated that your behavior disrupts our society. I've been accused of fear-mongering tonight because I think that someone who commits a crime against our election system maybe should have a pause before they elect, before they participate in the next election. 
uh, that to me seems just plain logical. If you're the person who went in there and disrupted others that are trying to cast their ballots appropriately and in some ways you negate by your actions other people's votes, maybe you should take a pause. Maybe you should not vote in the next election or two or three, depending on your sentence. I don't think that's fear-mongering. This uh, bill has been called Restore the Vote. Well, in many cases, as we've heard from many testifiers tonight, or many of our members tonight, uh, they, they'll never lose that vote. You can't restore something you haven't lost, after all. Uh, we should have an effort to fix our system. If we are, as I said earlier, putting people on 40 years of probation, that's not right. But that's not what this bill is about. This bill is about elections at its heart. And that's why I will be voting no on this bill, because I believe the bill does not have a filter. Um, there's no delineation between, uh, for instance, the election crimes and other crimes. It's just, eh, if you're out, you're out. And if you never went in, you never are punished in a way that eliminates your right to vote. So it's not restore the vote, it's keep on voting. Just keep right on voting. So what if you disrupted the election? Just keep right on voting, it's okay. On the other hand, uh, in the uh, election committee, we have some pillars. Uh, one is, uh, does this bill restore or improve public confidence? Well, I'm not sure it does because I want to be confident that everyone going to the ballot box to vote means to, to be there to cast their ballot appropriately, not disrupt the election. Another pillar is bipartisan support. And this is where I think my argument falls apart a little bit, Representative Frazier, because I do believe that some of the members on this side of the aisle have weighed this uh, particular bill and decided that, well, it's got some problems, but it's got enough good stuff in it that we're going to vote for it. The problem is we could have fixed some of those problems if we weren't in such a darn big hurry around here to get things out the door. Uh, a little more time in committee, a uh, little more serious consideration of appropriate amendments. This could be a much better bill than it is. Uh, I'll be voting no. Uh, I don't think everyone on this side of the aisle will be. But uh, I hope you understand that we have good reasons for our votes. And uh, it's not to disparage those that have served and repaid their debt society. The member from Hennepin, the author of the bill, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This, this has been a great uh, debate. And I really appreciate the uh, many things that were said today. And I say that I appreciate that from both sides of the aisle. But that's what this democracy is about, that we can have these conversations. This bill will give voice back to thousands of people that have been shut out of our democracy, that have not been able to have a voice in this conversation, have not been able to choose the representatives that sit in this room making decisions that will have a huge impact on their lives. I sat here and I listened to some of the things that were said, and, and, and oftentimes I think it is the concern about who's getting the vote back instead of why we should give that vote back. I'm not so much concerned about who's getting the vote back because voting is foundational in this democracy. And that is why the vote should be given back. That is why it shouldn't be taken away. And that is what this disenfranchisement law has done for over 100 years. I often talk about my grandfather, who was born before the Civil Rights Act was put in place, before the Voting Rights Act was put in place, down in a small town of less than 1,000 people in Mississippi. And I visited there when I was a kid often, every summer. It was hot, but every summer. My grandfather had to flee Mississippi when he was in his 20s because his life was going to be taken. And it was because of the color of his skin. 
I was the first one born outside of the state of Mississippi in my immediate family. He still reminds me of what it was like to have to leave his home because he was being prevented from being his full self and a full man in that place. He talks about how when he turned the voting age, he was turned away. Or relatives were turned away, friends were turned away. So the franchise of voting and making sure people have access and have their voices heard is a very personal thing to me. Because I have that close connection to the history of when it was taken away, violently, but legally, it was taken away. We are not that country anymore. We are not. I believe that. And that's on both sides of the aisle. I believe that we are not that country anymore. But sometimes, sometimes, I do hear comments that echo back to that past that are very disturbing. I heard a member say we should be here working on changing the system and also to keep our eyes open. As a black man, I have no choice but to keep my eyes open. I don't have the luxury of closing my eyes in this country or in this state. So my eyes are wide open. And I ran because my eyes are wide open. I see things that need to be changed and I am here to be a part of that change. I'm offering bills to be a part of that change. But what I don't always see is every colleague reaching back to say, let's do it together. And all I'm saying is, let's do it together. If you make a speech about changing the system, join me, join any of my colleagues. Let's do it together. Rob Kwan, we're gonna talk. And I appreciate everything you said, and I appreciate you continuing to stop me to say, let's work together. And I believe that you wanna do that, and we are gonna find a way to do that. Representative Du, thank you for what you said. I do believe you weighed this, and I do believe you're making your decision because you weighed that this is a good start. In my closing, I just want to say, we've, we've had a lot of conversations about some, some things that, uh, egregious crimes that have happened and why we should shut those out. But there are people here, up there in the rafters, that testified on this bill. And I do want to recognize some of those folks. People like Willie Lloyd, who's an educator, a mentor, homeowner, and a respected individual in his community. He's been out of the incarceral state for over a decade, but doesn't have a voice in our electoral process. People like Zeke Caliguri, was incarcerated for 22 years. He wrote a book while in prison, organized residents around the prison writing workshop. He's an award-winning author, came home in April, since then, he's been organizing around criminal justice reform and encouraging people to be civically engaged. These are the folks, these are the folks that we are saying, we want you to be engaged. We want you to be a part of the systemic change that makes not only Minnesota great and encourages people to come to the state, but will be a catalyst to make our country great. That is what this is about. That is what this is about. People like Kevin Reese, who runs an organization called When We Are All Free. That is what this is about. Folks that have paid their dues, been held accountable, back in the community, giving back the best way they know how. And all we have to do today is, is vote yes to give them their voice back in our democracy so they can choose who represents them, so they can choose who makes decisions about their lives. That's the power that we have. We should be judicious, we should use it wisely, and I'm encouraging you all, vote yes on this bill. The clerk will take the roll on the bill.
Members, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 71 ayes and 59 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.